Hi, it's Dave. Welcome. Today, I'm joined by Warren Redlick, and this is going to be a live stream. And if you've got some questions or comments, you can add them. Um, after the first part of this interview, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions and have kind of a chat. Um, so Warren Redlick is a YouTuber, a retired lawyer, and also a Tesla investor. And he has some of the wildest, craziest, most extreme price targets out there. And we've got a special episode. We're going to dive into uh, some of the things that he's been sharing. And I want to welcome you, Warren, to the show. Thanks for having me on. I'm a big fan. Awesome. Yeah. Um, it's been um, interesting and exciting to actually watch some of your stuff and go through some of your models. And um, yeah, I'm curious, like, um, um, before we get into some of your models, because I think some of your prices that you share Tesla could be at, I think one of them, were, were, you say that there's a possibility of Tesla being at $200,000, right, in 2030. Um, yeah. What percent possibility or probabilities do you give that? That I mean, do I you... Really I don't really do it that way. Mm -hmm. I, I just think, you know, it sort of depends on how things go. I, I think that, you know, more than $50,000 a share is significantly likely. 200000 a share, you know, you get to a point where antitrust authorities step in, right? Mm -hmm. When you yeah. get that big, um, that there are other repercussions that step in the way. So, but, you know, it's, it's really hard to predict all kinds of things. It's just, if you look at the numbers, if you say, okay, if they're going to produce this many batteries, if they're going to have this many robo-taxis, these are what the numbers say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can you can criticize the models. And there's 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 some really valid criticisms of my models, like, yeah. Warren, you're not taking into account taxes, which is true. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going with, like, gross margin, gross profit rather than net profit. And, you know, there's definitely some good criticisms, but I feel like I try to take care of those. And so the, the 200,000 is actually, it's actually 177,000 <laughs> is a step down from the 340,000 that, <laughs> that I actually came up with. And I said, well, to be fair, let's cut it in half. So, um, yeah. 200 okay wait wait $200,000 share price what is that in terms of market cap is that 200, um, 200 trillion 200 trillion because there's about a billion outstanding shares so um 200 trillion do you know you know you know the the market cap of the S&P 500 yes well <laughs> it's, no but it, go, it's only I, like I, 35 trillion right or so sure I, I hear this uh -huh. criticism all the time and I would just say go back to 2010 mm -hmm. or 2011 and tell someone that Apple is going to be over 2 trillion dollar market cap Right. Uh, and they're going to they're going to laugh at you. Go back to 2013 and tell someone that Amazon is going to be a one point six trillion dollar market cap. And they're going to be they're going to think you're crazy. And, you know, I bought Amazon in 2013 mm -hmm. when you know, the price earnings ratio was a thousand. Everybody's saying, oh, Tesla's price earnings ratio is too high. You just have to look at the, the Tesla is going after a much larger market than Amazon went after. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a global market. Uh, they're already in the largest car markets, except maybe Japan. I don't know how big, how much penetration they have in Japan. Amazon isn't in China, right? I mean, you know, and Amazon is hand is covering a much smaller market really than what Tesla is shooting for. Mm -hmm. You're talking about power and, and cars. It's bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> um, this is gonna be fun because I'm all, obviously I'm a Tesla bull as well. And so like, I'm not gonna, you know, deny that Tesla has a great feature head. Um, but if you're okay with it, I'll go ahead and, you know, challenge some assumptions sure. and we'll go through some of kind of your ideas and thoughts here. Um, yeah, just to be clear, so for people who don't know, yeah. you asked me for, for some of my spreadsheets and I sent you some of my spreadsheets before we did this. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, my whole purpose is just to encourage, you know, thoughtful, productive conversation. Um, hopefully, you know, I can learn something as well as others. And, and I think every kind of step toward conversation and dialogue is a step toward, you know, moving forward. And so um, this is great. Um, what is kind of your basic napkin math? If you could, I mean, there's models out there that you could go on f to explain for hours and hours, but I think sometimes the simplest models are the most powerful. Do you have like the ultra simple kind of something in your head where you're like, I don't even need to think about it. This is yeah. just how I value Tesla, like let's say five or 10 years down the road. I actually have two different models that I use. One is basically the robo taxi profit model, and the second one is the battery revenue model. The battery revenue model is pretty close to what Elon said on the, I think it was the, the fourth quarter investor call. Um, the robo taxi model is uh, probably simpler than that. The robo taxi model is really simple. At Autonomy Day, Elon said we'll have 10 million of our own robo taxis. So this is just looking at Tesla owned robo taxis, not looking at anything else Tesla does. 10 million robo taxis is what he said. 
He described $30,000 a year in profit per robo-taxi. I think the $30,000 was a reference to the private owners who are sending their their vehicles out as robo-taxis. I think Tesla's profit on the robo-taxis is higher, and I've run my own numbers on what I think profit is on a robo-taxi, which declines per robo-taxi over time as you saturate the market. But um, if there's only 10 million robo-taxis, you haven't come close to saturating the market. So I figure that's about $50,000 a year in gross profit, not net profit. So if you take $50,000 a year times 10 million robo-taxis, you get $500 billion in profit. Just, okay, so let's be clear. This is just robo-taxis. This is mm -hmm. not selling cars. This is not mega pack, solar, uh, power wall. Just on that alone, that's $500 billion a year in profit. And if you apply a, a price earnings ratio of 30, which is low, you get a, a $15 trillion market cap. You get a $15,000 share price just on that. Okay. So. Okay, so that's, so let's, that's a really simple napping math. That's not the okay, battery revenue model, but that's the robo taxi model. All right, uh, awesome. So let's let's talk about this. So ten million robo taxis making fifty thousand. You're saying gross. Yep. What I mean, what are you talking about gross? Are you talking about there's operating expenses? So what's the sure. what's the 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 operating income or let's say net profit off sure. of that? Um, I don't know. I think it's really hard to forecast that out. I think that the one of the biggest things that gets in the way that that separates gross profit from net profit is often administrative costs, you know, mm -hmm. selling general administrative expenses. Those decline over as the as your as your your economy as you scale up, those become smaller. So that that takes that takes away less taxes take away more. But keep in mind, I'm using a price earnings ratio of 30, which is kind because Amazon has a price earnings ratio of 75 right now, and it, and to me, a 10 million Tesla is still growing fast. Uh, sure. So, so, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I understand your question. The, the where I get the fifty thousand dollars from is if a vehicle drives sixty thousand, if a vehicle drives paid sixty thousand miles a year, making let's say a dollar a mile, which I think is low at this at, at the point of ten million robo tax, I think a dollar a mile is low. Mm -hmm. Then you're talking about sixty thousand dollars a year in revenue. My estimate of the cost per mile for the 2023 Tesla Compact is going to be below 10 cents a mile on the 100,000 miles. But if you drive 100,000 miles in order to serve 60,000 paid miles, right? Because some of the time the vehicle's driving empty, going from one ride to the next ride. And I think that Tesla is going to optimize its network and it's going to have very little, um, it's going to minimize the amount of time that the vehicle's driving unoccupied to maximize the, the, the miles that are paid. So I think, you know, People have said it's only 50%. I think that's ridiculous. It's going to be 60% or even 75%. So if you have $60,000 in revenue, right, because you have 60,000 miles times a dollar, and then you have 10, 000, 10 cents a mile times 100,000 miles driving, you have $10,000 in costs, you have $50,000 in gross profit. The 10 cents a mile comes from this. The In 2019, when Elon spoke at Autonomy Day, he said the then current cost of a, 20, a 2019 or 2018 Model 3 worked out to about 18 cents a mile. And about the same time, a company called Testloop, which was running uh, Tesla vehicles, uh, on, it, was, it was providing a service using Tesla vehicles. They estimated their cost for the Model 3 at 18 cents a mile. So it's not just E-Line. That's, that's depreciation, that's insurance, that's electricity, that's everything, <clears throat> 18 cents a mile. Go to the 2023 Compact, you're gonna have a much more efficient vehicle that's gonna have a million mile lifespan so the depreciation is spread over a lot more miles. The electric consumption is a lot less, a lot of other advantages, that, and that's going to make that vehicle, and it's going to cost less. So that vehicle is going to cost a lot less per mile. I think 10 cents a mile is actually high. I think it's probably going to be closer to 7 cents a mile when I when I work the numbers. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, a few things here. So let's give you the assumption of 10 million robo-taxis in 2030 or so. Now I, I think just, just be clear. I think actually, that's low. Yeah, I'm just okay. Using that number because Elon mm -hmm. said it. Sure. Um, it, I mean, yeah, it definitely could be higher. But let's say ten million robo taxis. I think a, I mean, a dollar per mile. That seems like extremely, extremely high because, I mean, like the cost to basically operate a vehicle right now is usually between thirty cents on the super low end to maybe you know, 70 cents, average it out, maybe 55 cents or so to, to actually own a car. Um, now there are people who are, you know, obviously doing it for lower than 55 cents. And the reality is going forward with battery cars, 
you're going to actually drive that, you know, uh, cost per mile down over time. So let's say in 10 years, you're going to have majority, if not you know, 90, 80, 90% of cars being battery cars, electric cars, that's going to drive down the cost of ownership. So the average cost to own a car, 55 cents right now, is going to be driven down, you know, to let's say 30 or 40 cents. How can a robo taxi charging a dollar compete with private ownership at 30 or 40 cents per mile? Don't you need it at least equal, if not lower than private ownership to really have a chance? All right, I don't we've got some lag here. I got some lag. I think on my end, or maybe um, on Warren's end. But we'll um, we'll wait. I think sometimes the lag actually works out um, after a couple minutes. Hopefully, the lag will work you're, out. You're you're mo you're moving in a jerky fashion, but I can see you now. Okay. All right. You're moving again. Okay. Yeah. I can hear you clearly. Okay. Great. Yeah. So, um, were you able to catch kind of the the yeah the argument? dollar how how do I think it's a dollar a mile? Exactly. So I just drove. I, I just took rides in New York City uh, on Lyft for the last, I took seven trips on Lyft in New York City uh, over the past four months. And my average cost per mile to me as the rider was $5 a mile. I mean, that's New York City. That's like the, the one of the priciest, okay, priciest, priciest taxi markets in the world because you've got these like medallion taxi riders and it's so dense and condensed. And, you know, it's like just riding a little bit is going to cost you a fortune in New York City. And that's such a small, like, what is that? Is that 0.1% of the market? I mean, the average Uber ride, according to ARK Invest, is I think about $1.85 per mile. Um, that's what okay, they're so calculating. You and, you, you and I have very different numbers. So mm -hmm. my impression of the overall average for Uber and Lyft is 250 a mile. Uh, I mm -hmm. think it depends on whether you include tip and whether you include other things. But I think 250 a mile is probably closer to the average nationwide or worldwide. The dollar, you said that you thought the average cost per mile is 55 cents. Tasha mm -hmm. Keeney thinks it's 70 cents. I was, my ballpark is 60 cents for the average driver. Mm -hmm. But 10 million robo taxis is barely punching the market when you have 10, 10 or 20 trillion miles driven worldwide. Um, you really need to get well over 100 million robo taxis to start making it tip. At 100 million robo taxis, you're really starting to saturate the market. So at 10 million robo taxis, you're barely making a dent. I mean, you're making a dent, but not a big dent. So I don't. I would put it this way: if you look at the the market and you say, I don't have the picture with me. Mm -hmm. I sent this to Gary. I sent this to Gary Black a while ago. There's a. If you look at a bell curve, mm -hmm. and you think, okay, Uber and Lyft have, you know, two million. Let's say they, they drive a certain amount. When you think about the bell curve going up, getting to that 60 cents a mile, when you, once you get to say 60 or 70 cents a mile, then you've got half the market, right? Half of the 10, half the 20 trillion miles. Even that, I, would, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of assumptions going into it. For example, if I could drive my own, let's say battery electric car, let's say average is 55 cents right now with ICE, if I could drive my battery electric car, even if it's a non-Tesla, and I get 40 cents, right? And why would I drive a, why would I take a robo-taxi for 60 or 70 cents? It doesn't make any sense. All right. So I think it's a big assumption that there will be competitive robo -tech, competitive electric vehicles from other companies that significantly lower the cost per mile. So for one thing, mm -hmm. it's my opinion, mm -hmm. okay? And you have different ways of looking at this stuff, yeah. but my opinion is that the major car companies are all gonna fail. They are, they are loaded with debt and they are not gonna be able to be competitive. So Volkswagen, Toyota, Ford, General Motors, they're all gonna collapse. The governments will bail them out and they will collapse again because they are structurally unable. If when the governments bail them out, they'll make it even harder for them to compete. So somebody's going to come along. Maybe it's Neo. Maybe it's Lucid Motors. Maybe it's, you know, uh, some EV company is going to come along. There's a challenge here. Once the robo taxi network goes live, it starts to become a question of for a lot of people. Do I want to bother owning a car? I think a lot of us have this attitude. Well, I like having a car. When you start to think about all the things that you have to do to maintain a car, you have to have a place to park it. You have to shop for car insurance. You have to shop for the car. You have to sell the old car. You have to get the tires changed. You have to get the oil changed. You have to get the wipers changed. You have to get it washed. Mm -hmm. um, you have to go find it. You, you went shopping somewhere. You have to go find it in a driving rainstorm. Um, all of these things are solved by a robo taxi network. Life in a robo taxi world is more convenient than life owning a car. It's hard to grasp that because we're so tied to our cars. Well, okay, so let's, um, okay, so for, for those who are joining in on live stream, I've actually asked Warren beforehand if it's okay if I 
interject and you know question me, some assumptions. <laughs> so this is a friendly you know discussion here. Um, where are you living? Are you are you in the, in the city like New York City or? No, I live in South Florida where our cars get hot. Really? Okay. Like, and we do get we do get heavy rainstorms. I live in Boca Raton, Florida, but I lived okay. in New York State. Okay. I lived I lived in Albany, New York, where we would get you know ice storms and snowstorms, and your car would be buried in two feet of snow. Yeah. When you came out from a movie, well, not two oh. feet of snow, but your car would be buried under snow, and you have to clean the car off, and you might have to de-ice the car to get the door open. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different people in a lot of different circumstances where sometimes owning a car is very inconvenient. And just just think back to the last time you shopped for car insurance. Was it fun? Um, actually, it wasn't too bad. Actually. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just called up Geico, and yeah, they took care of it. Um. What I've it's noticed, not fun, it's not fun in Florida. Okay. What I've noticed is there's two types of uh, car type of um, biases, um, and one is a, a city bias toward cars, which c cars are just a hassle, right? I I went to school at uh, UC Berkeley and I didn't have a car. Um, I went to grad school in in Asia in Korea and I didn't have a car. So like I didn't want a car. There was just a bias against cars. The more urbanized an area is, the 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 more inconvenient right a car is. But then on the flip side, I've also lived um, in the suburbs as well. Um, actually, I lived in LA, which which has kind of a mix. You know, it's kind of a bias, but not really a bias. But then once you go further out, there's a bias against not having a car, meaning like the personal ownership of a car is a really big deal because you're just handicapped without it. And even Uber and Lyft, they just don't make a dent in some suburb areas. Like it's just so inconvenient. And if I was to tell a person in like a, a suburb area um, that Uber and Lyft has not, I mean, there's a lot of areas like this that Uber and Lyft it isn't completely dense. I tell them, give up your car. That's like giving up a limb, you know, like they're not going to give up a car. The only way they're going to give up a car is if the robo taxi, right, is significantly cheaper than them owning a car. I don't see any other way. I mean, what what are your thoughts? No, I, I agree with you on that. And I think that the point is that if full saturation of the market is 100 million robo taxis, then 10 million doesn't have to serve rural areas. It doesn't have to serve the exurbs. Um, I live in a suburban area. Uh, between Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and West Palm Beach, Florida, and we have Uber and Lyft here. Mm -hmm. I was out on Long Island, I forget when, and it, there was it was difficult to get an Uber and Lyft when I was. This is a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. so you have to keep in mind that the odds are that robo taxis will be able to serve more areas because one, they don't depend on a driver, and two, they're lower cost per mile. So ultimately, we would expect that robo taxis would be able to serve more distant areas. And you got to keep in mind dynamic pricing as well, that you may be able to serve those areas that are further out. And I would just, you know, just give you an example. Yeah. When we, if you're only trying to serve 10% of the population, then that's a lot different than trying to serve 100% of the population. When you get out to 100 million robo taxis, sure, the price has to drop below 50 cents a mile in order to get that. And maybe it drops to 40 cents a mile. And you really start to get into, it's really hard to call you know, what's the upper limit on the robo taxi market? Is it 100 million robo taxis? Is it 200 million robo taxis? What's the future look like for robo taxis? Are they still in the form that we see cars now? Or do we end up with what my vision is a single passenger, you know, three, a single passenger vehicle that's half as wide and half as long and costs far less to manufacture and costs far, uses far less energy. And you're really able to get the cost per mile down to less than a nickel, maybe even three or four cents a mile for the for the owner, not for the not for the rider. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of other things like, you know, mini buses, right? Robo mini buses that can serve poorer populations. But when you're only talking about 10 percent of the population or 5 percent of the population, then something like 50 percent of the world population is urban. Maybe it's 30 percent. Maybe it's 50 percent. I forget exactly. But there's a lot of people who live near a city mm -hmm. um, yeah. and the number of people who and I, I get this a lot. People are like, well, I live 50 miles out from the nearest town. I need to have my car. Like, okay, well, then this isn't about you, right? It, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't, not not every bit has to be about you. It, if we're talking about 10 million robo-taxis and we think the ultimate market is 100 million robo-taxis, this is only serving 10% of the population. Mm -hmm. It's not that big of a deal. Um, I don't know if you've seen the ARC Invest. Um, one of their papers, they're actually saying that um, the ride hailing, the human-driven ride hailing market um, price is actually 50 cents per mile in China already, which is crazy. Because if you think about it, like they're doing human driven, right? Ride hailing at 50 cents a mile. Um, and if you kind of factor in the whole China equation is you're not gonna, 
you're not going to penetrate the Chinese market even one percent if you even equal 50, 50 cents. Meaning you really need to undercut human drive driving, you know, because it's so cheap out there. So when you look at the global scale, right, you have China like bill what one point four or five billion. You have India coming online. Yeah, like that's like. You know, add a few more countries, that's like half the world. And these guys, the labor cost is so cheap, you're down to ready 50 cents per mile on a human-driven ride-hailing network, meaning robo-taxi is going to have to, just to begin with, has to start at much lower than 50 cents. And wow. then you have all these other domestic companies coming in, fighting for the, the market. Like, like, how cheap will it go? And then will that impact your overall models? Because that's half the world there. Right. Well, so... I don't think that uh, Tesla can compete effectively in India. India is an extremely poor country with anything like a Tesla vehicle because they're just too expensive for the Indian market. And even robo taxi rides. I actually did a, a live stream interview a while back with uh, a guy who's from Egypt, which is a comparably poor country and fairly large population, not like India, but a fairly large population. And really what you have to do, what, what I think Tesla will do at some point is they will come out with something like a minibus, which is an Elon's master plan part two where you would, in America, you would pack 20 people into the minibus. I, I'm picturing something that's roughly the size of a Cybertruck in terms of length and width, mm -hmm. but designed to carry more passengers. Um, and if you squ squeeze 20 Americans in there, you probably squeeze 30 or 40 people in India in there. And I think with that, you get the price per passenger mile down below five cents, maybe even down to three or four cents a mile or less. And that is where you really start to serve a different, you know, a, a large percent of the world's population. So I think there's a lot of different, my, you know, there, there's this simplistic view, like we talked about mm -hmm. napkin math, right? There's the yeah. simplistic view that we're just talking about one vehicle that's doing all these things. You know, like just as an example, we were talking about passenger miles. Well, what about um, Uber, you know, replacing Uber Eats? What about the, the trip to Home Depot and the Cybertruck robo-taxi? There's a variety of tasks that the robo-taxi network can serve that isn't, isn't limited to passenger miles. You know, commercial traffic, contractor going from from home to to job from job site to job site, and instead of have, owning the truck, they have a trailer, and the cyber truck tows them from job site to job site. There's all kinds of ways that you can see the robo taxi network changing the way we do things. But um, I agree. Mm -hmm. I, first of all, I'm a little surprised at the 50 cent number in China because if that yeah. was true, why do why do people buy cars in China? Why would somebody oh, buy a cars are thousand dollar? Cars are cheap in China, and you, no, but people are buying sixty thousand dollar Neos in China. Oh man, it's all prestige out there, you know. It's all <laughs> like that's a different culture out there, you know. People buy cars for different reasons. Um, yeah. Right. Well, no, I mean, look at you. Look at India and the what is it, the Maruti Suzuki? Mm -hmm. They 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 have their cars are typically ten thousand dollars or less. But yeah. They don't they don't last a million miles. Yeah, I don't know how the cost equation work. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm over, I'm in over my head when you talk about the cost being 50 cents a mile in China, I find that hard to believe. Yeah. And especially as the Chinese economy rises, China is not a poor country anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how they're finding drivers, how they're compensating drivers that still manage to keep the price that low. Yeah. Cause I, that's, I mean, that's lower than the cost of operating a vehicle in the United States. Yeah, no, it's possible because I mean, I'd love to, to, to see ARC's numbers on it, but um, Asia, they have a, a labor market there that is just immense for so cheap. And that's why deliveries and everything is just mind blowing, uh, cheap and accessible. Um, I mean, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. But um, I'm curious, like, uh, okay, I want you to poke a hole in this, in this line of thought. So let's say you take 10 million robo taxis, let's say in 2030, which it could be multiples of that, but let's just take 10 million. Um, and let's say Tesla has to drive down the cost per mile to 25 cents. And this is on a global adjusted basis because let's say in China, it has to be even cheaper than that. Let's say 25 cents. And let's say out of that, Tesla takes a net profit of 5 cents. So 20 cents net profit, which is, you know, pretty re reasonable because it's a, and let's say it's a combination of Tesla company cars, but the majority are owner cars, which owners are taking, you know, a share. And then there's the electricity and maintenance and all this other stuff, right? So 20% not operating, not like gross profit, but even net profit off of, you know, sharing with owners and the car expense, et cetera. That we were left with five cents per mile per car. And let's say this, these 10 million cars run an average of 100,000 miles per year billable, which is, you know, maybe optimistic. Um, let's give it, you know, round up the numbers, right? For, to see, make it a little easier. So that's well, about, it's $5,000 $5, per car, right? Yeah. So let's times that by 10 million. 
So we're getting what fifty billion dollars, right? Well, yeah, I, I just don't. I don't think that's a reasonable number. To, I don't think it's reasonable to say that price is going to be twenty five cent. That they're going to make only five cents a mile profit uh, when there's only ten million robo taxis. And I'm not sure what you meant, by the way. Uh -huh. So Elon talked about having a Tesla owned fleet of ten million vehicles. There's a really important distinction that we, mm -hmm. you know, we we have to get out, break outside of napkin math for a second. Yeah. If you're like I, I have a Cybertruck on order. Mm -hmm. When I get my Cybertruck, I'm planning to press the "Go Make Me Money" button on the Tesla app and send my Cybertruck out to go make me money. It'll probably make me thirty thousand a year, fifty thousand a year, whatever. But the expect my expectation would be that a privately owned robo taxi is going to operate a lot fewer hours a week than a Tesla owned robo taxi. A Tesla owned robo taxi is probably going to run 18 hours a day from 6 a.m. to midnight. It'll charge between midnight and 6 a.m. I mean, there'll be some driving between midnight and 6 a.m., but very little. So most of the robo taxis will be charging from midnight to 6 a.m. And most of the Tesla owned robo taxis will be running more or less from 6 a.m. to midnight. So that's 18 hours a day where if. A privately owned robo taxi. Well, first I'm gonna, I'm not gonna send it out before I go to work, and then I get to work at nine o'clock, and then I send it out to make me money, and I have it come pick me up at five o'clock. So it drives eight hours a day, and then on the weekend, a couple weeks, what you know, maybe I send it on the weekend, maybe I don't. So the Tesla owned robo taxi is gonna do, you know, 100 hours a week, let's say, and the privately owned robo taxi is gonna do 40 hours a week, and Tesla only gets a, a probably less than 50 percent share of the revenue probably more like a 20 or 30% share of the revenue from that ride. So if you if you say that there's 10 million robo taxis and half of them are privately owned, you're really, really, really cutting into Tesla's profit. And you're so, you also sort of have to ask the question, why are we limiting Tesla to only 10 million robo taxis? I mean, I think it's a viable way mm -hmm. of looking at things to say, sure. well, Tesla's not gonna bother owning their own robo taxis. I, I don't agree with it. And I should, let me just address this for a second. Suppose your mission was to accelerate the transmission to, to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy and sustainable transportation. If you have a Tesla owned robo taxi that drives 18 hours a day versus a privately owned vehicle that on average, the privately owned cars, let's say drive six, six hours a day, right? Because some people don't put them out in the robo taxi network at all. Some do. You're replacing three times as many internal combustion engine vehicles if you have a Tesla owned robo taxi than if you have a privately owned robo taxi. So just from a, the company's mission, you wanna have Tesla owned robo taxis because they're gonna replace more ICE vehicles, they're gonna clean the air more. From a profit perspective, you're gonna make a lot more profit for Tesla if Tesla owns the robo taxi than if you sell it to someone else. So I'm not saying it's impossible that Tesla will follow a path that's less profitable and less pursuing their mission. I'm just saying it seems more sensible to me. And look, I'm an optimist, right? I can go with a bare scenario. I can go with the bare scenario that there's no robo taxis and I can still come up with a reasonably large valuation for Tesla. But if you're just going to if you if you hamstring the entire robo taxi model by saying, well, you only make a nickel a mile mm -hmm. and you only have 10 million robo taxis, I, I would concede mm -hmm. the price falls well below 50, you know, below 50 cents a mile when you have 50 million or 100 million robo taxis. At some point, the price has to come down. But I, you know, my perspective of the market is it's a long time before you get there, and 10 million robo taxis doesn't move that needle yet. Yeah, I mean, one one exercise that I kind of went through was um, I took an example of somebody commuting, um, and um, I used to live near San Diego, and a bunch of people would commute about 50, 60 miles per day each way. Um, so you're racking up, you know, 100 miles, you know, per day, and you're doing twenty or thirty thousand miles a year, right, on your car. So let's bring it down to let's say twenty thousand miles per year. And you know, a lot of people are driving like Honda Civics, or you know, trying to bring down their costs, or their, you know, uh, or even uh, even uh, even an electric car helps in that case if you can bring down your electricity. But at twenty thousand miles, you know, per year, um, if it's fifty cents per mile um, to own that car whether it's gas, electricity, maintenance, et cetera, we're talking $10,000 a, yeah, $10, a year. So you're talking about, you know, 800 and something dollars per month for to own the car and gas, right? Um, sure. And if let's say, you know, that's actually quite a hefty amount and they might be paying that right now. If it, if you include, let's say they're paying a $400 payment and three, $300 gas and insurance, et cetera, to, to make up $800. Right. Um, to do you know twenty thousand miles in a car, and that's at fifty cents. Now, for a person, to, 
And a lot of people actually, they're doing it for cheaper than that. You know, for example, they have a, a older car, they don't have a payment. Let's say, right? They don't have a payment. They're just paying gas and insurance, right? So a lot of these people are actually doing it at, let's say, 30 cents a mile about. Because if you, even 30 cents at 20,000, that's like $6,000 um, per year. So $500 a month. If you don't have any car payments, your car is paid off, right? Have, wait, wait, wait. So let's let's break this down mm -hmm. again. What, what car, we're talking about a Honda Civic. What was the Honda Civic worth when they started? So let's say it's it's a 10 year old car. It's the paint, there's no payments on it. Okay. okay. Well, what's it worth? Is it worth ten thousand dollars? Is it worth, it's worth five thousand like, dollars? It doesn't matter. Is this they've had it for well, a while? It matters because worth... it matters because you're you're not counting the depreciation of the car. No, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Okay, this is this is actually an example to put just help us get in the mindset of some certain people. Well, no, but if we if we if we decide we're not going to count depreciation, we also have to not count depreciation on the robo taxi. No, okay. If you're not going to count the depreciation on the car, because very you know not that many people are driving ten year old Hondas that they own outright. As a percentage of the population, okay, well, uh, the average the average person mm -hmm. is spending seventy cents a mile, according well, to Tasha Keedy. So you can pick out the person who's well, spending less than fifty cents a mile and say it won't work for them. But they're below. They're, we're only trying to give. We're only trying to hit ten percent of the market at ten million vehicles. True. Okay. So we don't. We we, we don't. If you uh -huh. pick out the ten percent who are least likely to use it, then sure, you make a compelling case they're not going to use it. But what about the what about ten percent of the population has a DUI conviction? What's their insurance rates? Okay. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Even, okay, so okay, I want to get into this whole... People don't know that, by the way. People don't know that, by the way. 10% of... <laughs> if you go down your street, uh -huh. there's probably at least one neighbor who has a DUI conviction, maybe two or three. Sure. People have no idea how many people have DUI <laughs> convictions, and they pay higher insurance rates. Definitely. Right? So it's easy to identify the person who's never had a problem in their life, and they live cheaply. Mm. But we all know there's a lot of people who, who've had problems in life and don't live cheaply. Yeah, sure. But okay, so at the point of this exercise, though, is just, for example, it's not to compare with RoboTaxi per se, it's just to get in that mindset of if I'm driving 200 or 20,000 miles a year, and let's say I could get by by spending 30 cents, actually, if I have a really old car that doesn't have payments, it's just paying for gas and insurance. And in that case, I'm doing 30 cents. And this is not, I think, a tiny percent, it's not like 1% or 5%. I think actually, there's quite a lot of people who do drive older car you have a bunch of the fleet that's older than 10 years you know and yeah but even cars yeah. that are older than five years most a lot of them don't have payments on them you know but you're you're focusing on the people who are unlikely to use it and, and all i'm saying is we only need 10 percent to be likely to use it to make a 10 million robo taxi fleet work okay okay so hold on off on that thought but the idea okay. is is you have a, a large cohort of people that even at 30 cents, let's say they're driving, you in order to win over that size, whether that's you could we could argue the size of that that group, but you really have to undercut 30 cents in my opinion. Because if if you say, hey, take a robo taxi to work and pay 50 cents, they're like, what are you talking about? You know, I'm paying 30 cents. It, it makes no sense. So I'm saying there's a, a tipping point where it where robo taxi gets so cheap that all I see driving practically, you know, just doesn't really make sense cost-wise. And the people who who choose to drive IC is because of non-cost factors, you know, it's just some other things. But but my hypothesis is we're gonna be approaching that 25 cents per mile target much sooner than what people realize. Because um, once you get a large group of these robotaxis in certain areas, you've got this saturation problem where for example, you can saturate different urban areas very quickly with certain, you know, several thousand robo taxis. Like, um, but what happens is you start to drive down the cost so rapidly, and then the harder areas are the more spread out areas, which you know it takes like five miles to get to pick up a person or something, and or even in suburb areas, it's just not as dense, you know. And so in those areas, it's like. Um, people are, are still going to drive cars unless you can bring down the cost so low. But in order to bring down the cost so low, you have to bring, you have to have a lot of density or just a lot of things have to work. And so I think in this market, I'm just saying it seems to me the most likely case is by 2030, the cost per mile is 25 cents. I mean, so let, let me address your saturation yeah. point. And I, you know, I, I can see that when you get out to 2030, you know, some of my models have a lot more robo taxis than 10 million. Mm -hmm. And then you are going to push the price down a lot more. Yeah. But um, th your description of the saturation, I, I agree that what, what Tesla has to do is they have to start, they have to identify a, an individual market when they first start the robo taxi network. So let's say it's Los Angeles, let's say it's Miami. They pick a particular market 
and they they go in, probably it's a market that already a lot of there are already a lot of Tesla owners. That's why California is pretty likely. South Florida has a lot of Teslas as well. I think California has more. Um, and you pick an individual market and you go there first. And people have said, well, the robo taxi network is going to start at a dollar a mile. Well, no, you can't price it to when, before you reach any kind of volume of robo taxis. You can't price it too low because if you price it too low, there's going to be too many people waiting for a ride. And you have to have dynamic pricing, essentially, to figure out. And you have to find what the price point is that works, which, you know, Uber and Lyft do already. They do dynamic pricing. So I think the idea that uh, robo taxis are going to go into Los Angeles and totally saturate the Los Angeles market and drive the price down to 25 cents a mile and then move to another city is an unrealistic way to approach this. They're going to enter a market like Los Angeles and they're going to get the price down to $1.50 a mile or a mile or dollar a mile. And at a certain point, it makes sense that, well, we probably should move to another city now because putting another robo taxi in Los Angeles and pushing the price down doesn't make a lot of sense when you can make two fifty a mile or $2 a mile in Dallas. So I think the, the way I would expect the market to grow is they start with one city, yeah. then they start moving to different cities, and they're not going to push the price down in city A to 25 cents a mile and then move to city B and charge $2 a mile because now all the people in city B are going to be upset that it's so expensive. I'll, right. Why, why aren't you charging us what you're charging in Los Angeles? So at some, you know, the, and we have a lot of cities in the United mm -hmm. States and Europe. And I, you know, I can't argue with you about China because I don't know what I mean, I know what the cost of taxis were. In, I lived in Japan for a year. Mm -hmm. I know the, the taxi rides in Japan were not cheap. Right. So, um, you know, and Japan is the fourth largest car market. So China is bigger than uh, the U.S., I believe. But, you know, there's still a lot of markets out there where there's a lot of room for robo taxis to get in and deliver this at a lower cost per mile than a lot of people are paying. And really, I, I, I just think that the way you describe that, you're not gonna hit saturation to the point of getting 25 cents a mile anywhere until you have a lot more than 10 million robo taxis everywhere. Okay, so here, here's another angle, is the reason why the cities are gonna be saturated rather quickly, I'm not saying in a couple of years, let's say in five or six years, um, I think it hits, you know, 25 cents within, let's say, 2026 or 2027, actually. But the reason is because usage is so high in those areas, you can make a lot of money off of, you know, 25 cents. But once you hit 25 cents, and let's say, obviously, it's all like everything is dynamic price, right? With all of the areas and robo taxis can drive themselves to different cities and different states to try to arbitrage the rates, et cetera. Yeah. But what happens is once you go out of that city and you're saying, oh, you know, look at this urban, a uh, suburban area that's 30 miles from the, or 40 miles from the city, um, I could charge a dollar per mile, you know, in that city. But the problem is, is the usage drops significantly so for example i get four times the usage i say in the city because i'm always booked i'm always busy i go out to the urban area i'm driving around waiting around driving around for for 75 percent of the time and therefore i have to you know i get a quarter of the usage in the suburb area so it equals out so i do a, a dollar suburb 25 cents urban but the urban miles is the majority of the miles because that's where the usage is and so ultimately the urban areas drive down the price. But you're not you're not gonna you're not gonna go from ninety cents profit a mile in the suburbs to five cents a mile profit in the cities because you got four times as much traffic in the cities. And I think I think I, you might be right. I want to be clear about mm -hmm. this. You might be right. This is one of those things. You know, we're always wrong. Uh -huh. We, we want to be less wrong. I, I disagree with you that that's the way it's going to work. And in particular, I think you're underestimating the power of Tesla's ability to optimize the robo taxi network <clears throat> to not run empty, to find where the demand is and be where the demand is. And, you know, probably, you know, it's at uh, 5 a.m. after charging, that robo taxi is going to be sent out to a spot that the network has, that the software has determined, this is the optimal place for you to be to get your first ride in the morning. Um, I, and I think really when you start to get into the middle of cities, you also have this problem that you're competing with mass transit. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot more demand suburbs into cities, cities into suburbs than there is inside cities. So, you know, when I when I was in uh, New York City, I wasn't taking uh, we did take one uh, one or two lift rides that were shorter trips. But a lot of our trips were to the airport. Right. Mm -hmm. four, probably three or four of our trips were to the airport. <clears throat> and one trip was from Jersey City to Brooklyn, which is a longer trip. 
So I don't I don't think it's quite so simple that you're just going to load them all in the cities. And and your your math about you're getting four times as much usage in the city. I don't think the difference is that great. And if you're dropping to a nickel profit versus 90 cents profit, then four X isn't enough to justify it. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, I understand the point. I think obviously everything is unknown because we're talking about extreme amounts of variation and assumptions of how things are going to work out. And so, I mean, it's interesting to, to just explore the different angles. Um, let me rephrase kind of the 2030, you know, napkin math and see if you could, you know, poke holes or what your thoughts are. So at 2030, let's say 10 million. So let's re rephrase it as Tesla owned robo taxis. And let's say hypothetically we give you know, my assumption of 25 cents per mile. And let's say we boost up the, the profit, net profit from 5 cents to 10 cents per mile since it's just Tesla owned. Um, at 10 cents per, per mile, and let's say hypothetically, we're doing 100,000 billable miles. That's, so driving miles is gonna be much higher because they're driving around without a passenger. So 100,000 miles with a passenger, quite aggressive. 10 cents per mile net profit, which is great because that's after expenses too. That's after operating expenses, after electricity, maintenance, you know, cleaning, you know, everything. Um, so I think that's pretty aggressive too. So that's $10,000 per car. So $10,000 per car for 10 million robo taxis, that's a hundred billion dollars in net profit. So what's kind of the, the flaw in I think that's, I think that's, I think that's gross profit, but yeah. Well, yeah, um, I'm giving kind of net profit, the 10 cents net profit per, um, okay. yeah, per mile driven. So that would end okay, up to so be a hundred billion net profit. So what's kind of like, uh, the, 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 the hole in this logic? Well, I mean, I guess I would, I would ask you this question. Um, this is a question neither of us can answer. How many robo taxis does it take to saturate the overall market? Mm -hmm. I, I think that the, you and I disagree uh, you have this perception that they'll saturate cities first and that cities will get oversaturated before they spread out to the suburbs. And I think that's less, I think there will be some of that. That will be somewhat true, but I think that it will, any network optimization would send a lot more vehicles out to the suburbs if the profit is much higher in the suburbs. And, you know, I think, you know, rural areas are going to be tough and they're not going to happen. I'll just tell you, you know, I did some more, I don't call it NACI math. I did my own little spreadsheet, which I, which I did today in preparation for this. And, I came up with just as an example, 32 million. And I'm not saying this is accurate, but I'm saying you could go with 30, you can come up with any numbers you want. So I ran, let's start with a million robo taxis in 2025 and double it every year. And I get to 32 million robo taxis in 2030. And I'm, I have declining profit and I get um, $31,000 in profit. This is gross profit, not net profit, gross profit per vehicle. And I get a trillion dollars in gross profit a year. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can you can play with it and then you get, you know, you get your price earnings ratio. You play with those numbers. You can look at it a lot of different ways. Um, mm -hmm. And the problem is you would neither one of us knows what the numbers will actually be. One of the things when I hear people say 25 cents a mile, it's often like it's Gary Black and Gary is saying, well, competition is going to drive the price down. But no other prospective robo taxi operator is going to be able to match Tesla's underlying cost per mile. This is, a, if, if you don't mind us changing the subject yeah, slightly to talk about okay. that for a second. Yeah. Um, I mentioned, you know, that um, that Tesla Loop and Elon both said that the Model 3's cost per mile was about 18 cents a mile. And I think when you get to the 2023 Compact, the vehicle that they hinted at, or more than hinted at at Battery Day, I think that's going to drop below 10 cents a mile in operating cost. And I, I actually, I ran my numbers again, but it was 7 cents a mile, but I'm you know, winging it because we don't really know what the vehicle is yet. Mm -hmm. So um, if you look at, say, Waymo, they have a $100,000 vehicle that has a 100,000 mile life, right? So they're a dollar a mile on the depreciation, not counting interest, right? So th there's no way Waymo is going to be able to compete unless they're able to come up with a less expensive vehicle that lasts longer. Like we don't know. And, you know, the, the LiDAR uses a lot of electricity. So their cost of electricity per mile is higher. Um, I haven't seen yet a competitor that's, I, first, I don't think anybody's close on FSD. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone yeah. is close on FSD. But if somebody was close on FSD, let's say it's Waymo, their operating costs are too high. So, you know, one of the things that's going to drive down price is supposedly competition, but they're really, the, the competition is what you described, that I have my existing vehicle, my Honda Civic that's 10 years old. My mom, my mom, by the way, used to drive a 10 year old Honda Civic mm -hmm. and her cost of operating was really, really low. Mm -hmm. uh, so I agree with that. Um, so the competition is really trying to get cars, get people to leave their cars behind. But at 10 million robo taxis, you haven't, 
you're not diving that much into displacing people from their cars. You're really only starting to displace people from their cars when you get down. I mean, you're going to displace some, right? The people with the DUI convictions, the people who are who have you know high costs for whatever reason. It's easier to get those people out of their cars. But you know, you're going to start with the Uber Lyft market and the taxi market, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to take those out first. And then gradually you you just sort of figure different there's a there's a bell curve. I'm doing a little bell curve Im image here, right? So you've got people at the high end of the market, they're gonna switch first. The the lower you bring the price, the more people you get. And the market like 10 X's long before you get to 70 cents a mile. The market of people going from Lyft to RoboTaxi, you know, going from two fifty a mile for Lyft and Uber down to a dollar fifty a mile for RoboTaxi, the market like five X's or ten X's just on that alone. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. I may, I'm not sure if I, I may, have, I may have taken it too far off topic. No, 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 no. I, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, um, if you take the total miles driven in the world, let's say at 10 million, I think it might be higher. 10 trillion. 10 trillion. 10 or, it's 10, 10 or 20 trillion. Yeah. Let's go with 10. I mean, I've heard 10. I heard 15. Um, but let's say 10. Um, and if you have 10 million robo taxis um, driving at 100,000 miles per year, um, then what you got is you have a trillion miles, right? So with 10 million robo taxis driving 100,000 miles, you're saturated basically 10% of total miles driven. Sure. Right? So well, I'm saying what I'm saying is actually that's a significant amount, actually 10% of the entire global miles driven. It's not 1%, you know, this 10% sure, well, is, is, is decently high. Depends on what we're you know, what are we including in the 10 trillion miles, right? So mm -hmm. don't forget that there are people riding mass transit and a subway in New York City costs 275 each way. Mm -hmm. And there are places where, pe like, I'm literally deciding, am I gonna take Uber or Lyft to the airport or am I gonna take uh, the subway or, or, or Long Island Railroad or some kind of train? Um, am I gonna take some kind of mass transit? And right now the gap is, the, is so much that I'm choosing to take the mass transit option, right? Usually when it's just me, mm -hmm. And I fly to New York City, I take mass transit rather than Uber or Lyft, unless it's like really late at night and I don't want to deal with it, mm -hmm. right? But when I go with my family, we take Uber and Lyft because there's three of us in the car. So even though it costs us more to ride Uber and Lyft than it, do than it does to ride mass transit, because our, our mass transit price is three times as high, but our Uber price is the same, mm -hmm. it starts to make sense. Well, now cut the cost of Uber in half. How many people who were riding mass transit before decide to take RoboTaxi instead? It's very hard to suss out those numbers. And then... What about the Uber Eats trips? Do those count as passenger miles? Are those in the 10 trillion miles we're talking about? What about the contractor who's driving from place to place or deliveries? There's a lot of miles that are driven that might be taken over by some form of robo taxi. Mm -hmm. And we don't know whether that's included in the 10 trillion or 20 trillion miles we're talking about. I just saw the number, by the way, 4 trillion in the US alone. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it's hard to know what numbers yeah. are right. Yeah. But I saw 4 trillion in the US alone. So, if we got a trillion miles, you've only got a quarter of the U.S. market. Yeah, yeah, which is actually, I would say it's pretty big, actually. I mean, a quarter. But, I mean, yeah, I, actually, I would agree on that point in the sense that I think with autonomous driving at a super cheap price at a quarter uh, or 25 cents, I think the total miles driven will increase rather substantially because it'll unleash a whole new kind of realm of possibilities of of transport because right now there's a cap on what you want to do in terms of driving and getting places because of that cost factor but if it's like half the cost or less you have a whole market of kids you know who are going to take robo taxis to their school and back right, right now their parents have to drive right or you have people like you know i want to wake up in the morning tomorrow morning at a state or national park or at the beach you know and yeah. i will do that. You have just a, a whole proliferation of use cases that autonomous driving at a super cheap price, you know, yeah. uh, opens up. So yeah, I think that the total numbers number uh, number of miles driven will substantially increase. Whether it's two times or three times or four times, I don't know. I mean, this is all the guesswork, you know. I can, think. Can I just address something yeah. that you you reminded me of? Mm -hmm. So I think you have kids and I have kids. Yeah. My kids are probably older than your kids. I have a 16 year old and a 19 year old. So when my 19 year old got a driver's license, my insurance rates went up $2,500 a year. And my 16 year old does not have a driver's license yet, but I'm expecting, I, I believe we took the 19 year old who's off at college in New York City, which is why we're going to New York City. Um, I believe we took the 19 year old off the policy, but when the 16 year old gets licensed, we're gonna pay another 2,500 a year. Friends of mine, their kid got their license and they got him a car. Now their insurance went up 4,000 a year. So 
one of the things I think we need to think about is how many people are going to have their 15 year old or 16 year old get a driver's license when, <laughs> and I, I did the math, honestly, I did the math. I tried to persuade my wife, let's not have them get licenses. Let's have them take <laughs> Uber and Lyft because the cost of riding Uber and Lyft versus, cause they don't drive that many miles. Yeah. My kids don't, other than, you know, doing lear learner's permit training, right? My kids just don't drive that many miles. If it costs us, you know, $2,500 a year for the kid to have a license, how many Uber rides is that? Mm -hmm. Right. They just don't drive that much. Yeah. So but I lost that argument as I lose most arguments with my wife. And um, but I think that argument is going to be more compelling when the price of the ride goes down. And so far, you know, you would think that the insurance we don't know what's going to happen with insurance rates. My experience, the cost of a child getting licensed, that insurance rates might go up. Mm -hmm. Right. It doesn't seem like insurance rates ever go down, does it? Crash rates go down, but insurance rates go up. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Yeah, I just think that's a that's but that's an expansion of the yeah. market because you're taking it from the person who already mm -hmm. has a car, and they've had their car and their car they've had their car for ten years and their car is you know paid off and everything, but there's a big chunk of people coming on the market every year who are sixteen or seventeen years old who pay very high insurance rates, and all of a sudden it's like, well, wait a minute, the the, the people who are making the decision are the parents. And some parents will be like, why would I have my kid get a driver's license and pay that much more for car insurance? So there's a lot of different angles on how this happens. And it's it's very easy for us to put ourselves in our own shoes or in the shoes of someone we know. And because I have kids who are of driving age and I've been through this, I see that angle of the market as well. And because I'm a drunk driving defense lawyer, I see the people who pay extra extra for car insurance because they have a DUI conviction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I t definitely agree there's lots of different, you know, groups and factors. I mean, one of the use cases or one of the scenarios I see is actually um, the miles driven actually might not decrease as much in terms of human driven miles as what some people think. Um, I think there will be at least in the next five or 10 years because people will like to drive. There's a ton of cars already out there. You know, they're not going away yeah. anytime, any soon. But I think what we could see is the autonomous driving miles just radically increase and get to the point where they outpace and become larger than the human driven miles. And so, for example, let's say in 2030, um, or let's say 2035, I don't know when, what the time, but in 10, 15 years, you have maybe even have eight to 10 trillion human driven miles, but you have 10 or 15 or even 20 trillion uh, autonomous driven miles. And so it's just, um, it's not necessarily like it's going to be a transition meaning, you know, um, yeah. this shift to autonomous driving. Yeah. And it's not a, it's not a fixed pie. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. The, the pie might grow. Exactly. I yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and I think, I think, you know, you can look at what Elon and Drew said at battery day that they're hoping to produce 20 million vehicles a year and the global fleet is 2 billion vehicles. Yeah. So on that numbers, it would take a hundred years to replace the global fleet. If the robo taxi network means that each vehicle replaces five vehicles, then it, it cuts the time it takes to replace the global feed down to 20 years. So you're still going to be, and then, you know, we're not at 20 million vehicles a year until 2030. So it's going to be a long time before we get rid of all the human drivers. Yeah. It's going to be a long time before we get rid of all the ICE vehicles. Exactly. Yeah. Um, going back to robo-taxi uh, mo napkin model here. So again, I'm going to throw it out with a little bit adjusted numbers here. Um, so we were at 10 million robo-taxis getting 10 cents or doing 100,000 miles at 10 cents and making $10,000 per robo taxi. And then, so we were making $100 billion uh, per year off of 10 million robo taxis. If you do a 30 multiple, we're at $3 trillion. But yeah. let's say um, this is covering basically 1 trillion miles. So let's say we take Elon Musk's whole 25% of the autonomous wait, wait, driving market. Wait, I gotta stop you for, yeah. I gotta stop you for a second. We're at a $3 trillion dollar market cap on the robo taxis alone. Exactly. Yes. Yes. They were, they're also selling cars and they're also selling mega packs and solar. Exactly. But yeah, that's definitely. So we're just talking about robo taxi right now. But yeah. let's say uh, Tesla does reach their, you know, twenty five percent. Let's say it's twenty five percent of ten million uh, uh, driven miles. So let's say, I mean, that's being conservative, but two point five trillion miles. So that means there would have to be twenty five million robo taxis to get two point five or twenty five percent of ten trillion miles so 2.5 so let's just del uh, times everything by two and a half so you just just be, just to be really clear uh -huh. i don't think a robo taxi will be able to do i shouldn't say won't be able to i think an, on average a robo taxi will, will not be able to do 100,000 paid miles a year i think that it, it, despite my optimism <laughs> 
I think that you're probably looking at 300 miles a day, which works out to 300 miles total driven miles a day, which works out to about 100,000 total then, driven miles mm -hmm. a year, which works out to maybe 60 or 70,000 paid miles. But we can use 100,000 exactly, yeah. as a shorthand. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, I actually agree with that. Um, the billable miles would be lower, but just, just to shorthand it. And then, so we're looking at... Um, if it's ten thousand dollars net profit per vehicle, you have twenty five million robo taxis. You're looking at two hundred fifty billion dollars. So let's give it a three times multiple. We're looking at seven point five trillion dollars in market yep. cap. I mean, is that too bearish for you, or, or do you think that's well? You know, no, I mean, if you if you combine, <laughs> well, no, so look, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh -huh. um, I I think that's unnecessarily bearish, but I don't think it's crazy. I mean, you could go the other side and say, well, uh -huh. what if what if they do 30 million robo taxis and they make a, you know, they're still making 50 cents a mile in profit, right? You can, you can play with the numbers mm -hmm. all sorts yeah. of ways, but you know, if you take, let's say it's $5 trillion in market cap based on the robo taxis, and then you figure, okay. And they're also selling 20 million cars. You, you get to this interesting trap though, when if you're selling cars and you've got your robo taxi network, yeah. there's this sort of conflict, right? Because uh -huh. why am I buying a car if I could just ride in a robo taxi or why am I riding in a robo taxi if I have a car? They sort of compete with each other, the two models. Mm -hmm. But like you said, there's people who live in rural areas that the robo taxi network isn't going to serve. Um, there's places where the robo taxi network isn't approved. I expect it'll take longer for Europe to approve the robo taxi network. So there's a lot of different variations there. I think actually a lot of the revenue and profit is going to come from Tesla Energy, which I, I forget when you're when are you talking to Matt Smith. Is that after me? Oh yeah, actually I just talked to him, and the uh, interviews are going to be released tomorrow and the day after. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So he talks more about energy. Mm -hmm. I think the margins on energy are crazy. I think people have no idea what the margins are going to mm -hmm. be once they scale production of Megapack, production of solar, production of Powerwall. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, yeah, sure. So if 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 you're limiting me to seven point five trillion in robo taxi market cap, and then we get to uh -huh. add in energy and selling vehicles, sure. Uh -huh. You know, like I told you before we started the call, my bear scenario is eighty five is, is eight hundred eighty five hundred dollars share price or mm -hmm. eight point five trillion market cap. You can get the other one point five trillion market cap on the rest of the company. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, all right, we're making ground. <laughs> no, actually, like I think what's 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 interesting is. Um, uh, no one knows the feature. So all of this is like guesswork. And as much as you can guess, I could guess, a viewer can guess, we all have legitimate, you know, uh, ways to, to look at things. So um, I think that's the cool thing about investing, you know, it, um, there's so much um, opportunity, you know, for, for yeah. people. Um, I would just say the one thing is you, you, there are one of, I do different models and, yeah. and the robo taxi model is an optimistic model in the sense that there's a lot of people who think robo taxis won't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I, I am convinced that I'm not convinced. I think it's likely that we will see a robo taxi capable vehicle operating on a road somewhere this year, not not actually serving in a robo taxi network. And we will see a robo taxi network go live somewhere in 2022. Yeah, I, I think Florida, Florida, for those who don't know, it's already legal in Florida. Mm -hmm. Self-driving cars are legal. Robo taxi networks are legal. And the law actually prohibits cities and towns and counties from regulating or taxing them. It's it's at the state level. So and Governor DeSantis and the Miami mayor, Elon is popular with certain Florida government officials who matter a lot. So I would not be surprised to see a robo taxi network go live in South Florida before the end of 2022. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But so but there are people who don't think the robo taxi network is going to happen. Right. So the robo taxi story isn't persuasive to people. And so. I think there's other models. We I don't know when you want to, if you want to get to it, but there's yeah. other models to talk about. Yeah, yeah, no, this is great. Um, yeah, I'm actually, you know, I'm super bullish on you know robo taxi, um, and I agree with you. It's something that it's one of those things that it's hard to understand and grasp because in a lot of ways it's it's technical. It has to do with technology that is unproven, and even the people, the the brightest software engineers in the world are all disagreeing on approach you know and it yeah. adds to the confusion it's, there's not like one view to it and tesla has you know slated or has put all of their 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 coins in one basket you know that most of the industry actually disagrees with and um this is <laughs> to me let's, uh, let's keep in mind that most of the industry disagreed with landing orbital rocket boosters yeah yeah definitely yeah and most of the industry disagreed with electric vehicles yeah, yeah. so uh -huh. i i don't agree that the that intelligent people that intelligent, experienced people uh -huh. differ. I think that 
Uh, you know, your your conversations with James Doma were compelling. Yeah. I think that if you talk to George Holtz, it's compelling. Mm -hmm. We drive with two cameras that are fixed in the same place. We don't have sonar. We don't have radar. And we somehow manage to drive reasonably safely most of the time. The Tesla car has a lot more cameras. Um, it has faster processing speed in some ways. You know, our brains are pretty remarkable. But I don't know what percentage of our brains are actually going into the driving task. So... Um, I, I think it's, I think, uh, uh, did you see the Andre Karpathy, uh, robot brain? Did you listen to yeah, the robot brain? Yeah, uh -huh. He, he, he was very, very careful not to say it. They're close. Yeah. You, I could, I could hear in his voice. Yeah. They're close. I mean, the thing that stuck out is he's saying, uh, no more human ingenuity is required. All we need is data and compute power. Like yeah, that's exactly. it. Basically it's, it's solved. You know, they just yeah. need to add data and compute power and it's done basically um if you, if you if you haven't seen it the jim keller interview with lex friedman the first one yeah where they had this back and forth and lex friedman who's a very bright guy right mm -hmm. uh, and knows the artificial intelligence he's convinced that this at that point he was convinced oh you know self-driving cars can take a while and jim keller's like it's identify objects identify ballistic probabilities it's not more than that and lex is like yeah it is it's like no it's not <laughs> and jim keller was so he's like uh -huh. Sometimes he's mild mannered, right? But he was all of a sudden he was like, no, 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 this isn't complicated. So I think yeah. that um, it's pretty clear that's going to happen. But I do think it's there are a lot of people who are just really skeptical about it, and I understand the skepticism because it's hard to grasp exponential change. The same people who are skeptical about landing orbital rocket boosters. The yeah. same people who are skeptical about electric vehicles at all. There's still people who think that electric vehicles aren't going to work. Yeah, right. Yeah. There's a uh, John Cadigan and, and Scotty Kilmer. I've made fun of these guys on my YouTube channel a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, they're like they're like, oh, EVs, they won't work. They won't work for this purpose. They won't work for that purpose. There's still people who think they won't work for semis. Um, it, it, like how many times do you have mm -hmm. to be proven wrong before you start to think maybe this will work? Yeah, definitely. But, but I do think it's important to address that. And, and the battery revenue model, I don't know when you want to talk about yeah. it, but the battery revenue model really does address it, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, with robo taxis, you know, you're giving me, you know, 70, um, 7.5 trillion or basically $7,500 in share price in 2030. So, um, but I mean, that's a far cry from 200,000. I mean, 200,000, I mean, what part of that is like just moonshot, like just 1%? I mean, just like. Well, so the, the, the 200,000 mm. share price was based on the battery revenue model. Okay, not so it's the not the robo taxi. Model. Okay. All right. Robo, I mean, well, I can, I can get there. Sorry, let me, I don't think you guys can see this, but I can, I, you know, I, I ran some numbers this morning. Uh -huh. And if you go with 100 million robo taxis making $25,000 mm. gross profit, which is a stretch, I, yeah. I agree, this is a stretch. Yeah. We don't know how the future is going to unfold, but then you get gross profit, not net profit of 3.3 .3 trillion a year. And then you put a 40 price earnings ratio on that. And then just on the robo taxi network alone, you're at $132 trillion market cap. Yeah, but what's the, pro what's the cost per mile on that? Uh, you're probably doing a dollar, right? How can you do a dollar with... That's, that's 50 cents a mile and uh, 5 cents a mile cost. It's 45 cents a mile profit. Um, Twenty. So you have thirty. You have thirty thousand dollars in revenue at fifty cents a mile on sixty. Sixty. You have sixty thousand yeah. miles paid. Uh -huh. You have a fifty cent price per mile. Mm -hmm. You with me so far? Yes. Uh -huh. The total revenue for that is thirty thousand dollars for the year. Mm -hmm. The cost per mile is a nickel a mile, but on a hundred thousand miles because you're driving more miles than you're paid, mm -hmm. and that works out to five thousand dollar total cost. You get a twenty five thousand dollar profit. Again, this is gross profit, not net profit. There's you know taxes and interest and all these other things that could cut into it mm -hmm. but it's a twenty-five thousand dollar gross profit if you're doing 50 cents a mile sixty thousand yeah. miles paid that's twenty five thousand dollars per vehicle now i think you're probably correct yeah. that you might not be able to sustain a 50 cent yeah. price per mile yeah. with a hundred million robo taxes. exactly yeah but i don't know that and you don't know that either and you know, the Chinese economy is growing the cost of a chinese robo taxi a chinese human ride hailing driver might go up um, the cost per mile of a vehicle operating in China might be less. I also, I have my own vision. I mentioned it earlier mm -hmm. for, you know, you go to a single passenger robo taxi that's three yeah. feet wide and, and five feet long instead of, or maybe six feet long, whatever, half the width and half the length of current cars, yeah. a quarter of the, a quarter of the mass, right? It's a quarter of the cost to make it. So the, the cost of the vehicle goes down a lot. You're able to mass produce them in a much higher volume. 
you're getting the cost per mile down dramatically, and you're able to produce them in higher volume, which means you can spit more of them out. And you drive, the, this is that, it's that one thing where if you drive the cost down enough, maybe people start taking trips they wouldn't have taken before. Let me just give you an yeah, example yeah. of this. I just want to give you an example because we were talking about this earlier. How does the how does the traveled miles grow? So I live in South Florida. You live in California, right? Uh, Texas, right now, actually. Texas. Yeah. Okay. So, so I live in South Florida. Uh, we're about a three hour drive from Disney, mm -hmm. Disney World. A lot of people, not me. I'm not a Disney World fan, but a lot of people in South Florida, are Disney World fans. Mm -hmm. And right now, they'll go up for a week, a long weekend, say, and it's a three hour drive there and a three hour drive back, and they got to pay for a hotel. Now, what if the boring company does a tunnel underneath the Everglades? And I've already, I did a video with a Florida geologist. This is viable, right? Mm -hmm. You do a boring company tunnel from South Florida to Disney World. It's about 150 miles, 150 miles an hour. You get there in an hour. Maybe you make it a hyperloop and you get there faster. But, you know, what if it was an hour each way and it cost 10 bucks, right? How many people would say, well, I'm not staying in a hotel. I'll just take the loop back home, mm -hmm. sleep in my own bed and go back the next day. And you would have a lot more miles traveled if you dramatic if you lower the costs per mile that much. And then let's say you do you have a van, right? You have the 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 twenty passenger minibus that's going through the tunnel, and you know it costs me five dollars each way. You can you you can see where you can really drive this cost down and really increase miles traveled if you make. And I, actually, one of the side notes, by the way, is I think that dramatically reducing the cost of transportation could really increase demand for. Consumer demand for destinations, for the Disney World, for the beach, for Boca Chica. I don't know if Boca Chica is going to become an amusement park watching rockets launch, you know, but um, there's a lot, you know, maybe maybe malls like the large malls, like the, the Mall of America's, whatever, the biggest malls. Some of these places are going to experience a lot more demand because all of a sudden it's so much easier and so much cheaper to get there that people who would normally sit at home decide to travel. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you remember in the, in, um, Battery Day presentation, they have this one slide, um, and it was talking about um, 10 terawatt hours needed for transportation per yes. year. And then the first, so they had like semi truck, pickup truck, you know, luxury cars, compact, you know, um, medium cars. And then they had this other section with, with, a, with a covered car, and it was like robo taxi. And it was interesting because they already had, it was next to the section that was compact and I think yeah. medium or something. So they're kind of isolating a separate section for robo taxi and it actually looked smaller than the compact medium section. So it makes me think maybe Tesla has in plans like a, another generation or something, you know, like a smaller vehicle than even the $25,000 car, um, some type of, you know, smaller robo, you know, vehicle that's ultra small. I don't know how small it can go, but yeah, it, it reminds me kind of of that of just just what you shared. You're talking about the you're talking about the slide. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the slides right now. Yeah, you're yeah. Not talking about, you're not talking about the diversified cathode approach slide, are you? Um, no, it's 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 talking about um, ten terawatt oh, hours needed. The ten terawatt hour slide. Yeah, for transportation, the source was EV dot EV dash volumes. Um, uh -huh dot com and um yeah so maybe actually actually I'll, I'll i'll what i'll do is actually i'll screenshot this and i will i'm looking at the slide deck right now okay yeah yeah it's, i don't know if, i don't know if you if you want me to distract myself it's from a, the conversation no but. it's page six and i'll oh, go ahead and i will um drag in um this onto the screen so folks can take a look at it. So yeah, the, no, so the, the, the vehicle um, there, that's the, that's the 2023 compact. You know, I, is, I don't, I don't know if it is because if you look at the, it's under the same tarp. Yeah, it, it is under the same tarp, but think about it. They're, they're saying only one po or 1500 gigawatt hours. So that, what are you, what are we talking about? That's not, that's, you, you know, the model two twenty five thousand 25,000 car is going to be much bigger than that. That's not, you know what I'm saying? Okay. So I don't, I don't just, this is nitpicky. I don't use the term model two. Yeah. But if you watch the Sandy Monroe, Elon Musk interview, what I see coming is right now we have the gigafactories that are being built in Berlin and Austin. And as I heard what Elon was saying, the next factories are going to be a next generation factory that's going to build that vehicle on the far left, the, the compact robo taxi, which, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly how compact it's going to be, but. I think those are going to have smaller battery packs. I think they're going to have 40 or 30 gigawatt hour, 40 or 30 kilowatt hour packs. They're going to be so efficient that they're going to be 
I think you, if, if you think about a robo taxi world, you could say, you know, how, what, how much range does a, a dedicated robo taxi have to have if it's an urban robo taxi? And I think you might be able to get by with 200 miles range mm-hmm. on a on a dedicated robo taxi because it starts at 6 a.m. It drives till sometime afternoon until it's you know used 180 miles, let's say. So it's got 20 miles of range left. And it's using lithium iron phosphate, so it's not as sensitive to using too much of its capacity. Mm-hmm. And then at some point, the network optimizes and says, okay, it's your turn. Go to this charging station. And it charges midday. It charges half an hour. It only loses 3% of the day if mm-hmm. it charges 30 minutes out of an 18-hour day. Mm-hmm. So it may make more sense to make a larger volume of 200. I mean, I, I kind of wonder about the 1,500 gigawatt hours there because yeah. I would think you'd stop making – I, in my in my vision of the, the the 2030 world, you're predominantly making smaller vehicles because most rides are one passenger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you don't yeah. you don't need a five passenger vehicle for that world. So I don't know how much thought they put into that. I don't know if this was genuine. Yeah. Uh, this this slide pushes against the robo taxi world because there there's a lot more vehicles that aren't robo taxis. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I want to go into your battery uh, revenue model. Um, sure. And, um, cause yeah. Um, and can you go ahead and explain kind of, yeah, you know, the, the basic nap- napkin math so I could try to poke some holes. <laughs> sure. A little, a little history with it is I started with a model where I looked at every product line that Tesla had and maybe one or two that they didn't have yet. Like the, the 2023 compact, which hasn't been built yet. And I sort of projected, okay, this is what it's going to cost. This is what its battery pack is or will be. And I figured out how much revenue does Tesla generate? per kilowatt hour for that platform, whether it's Powerwall, which has a 13.5 kilowatt hour pack and a $7,500 price, or it's a compact, let's say a Tesla Model 3, which has ballpark, uh, uh, this is oversimplification, again, I love oversimplifying. Let's say it has a $30,000 Model 3 and it has a 50 kilowatt hour pack. They actually have larger packs Mm -hmm. and they have higher prices. But I basically came up with a number that currently, Tesla is making about $600 per kilowatt hour in revenue. Mega pack, actually makes less. Megapack is closer to $300 a kilowatt hour. Um, Roadster will make a lot more. Semi, it sort of varies depending on how big the battery pack is going to be on a Tesla Semi. But the vast majority of Tesla vehicles are actually, Tesla products are making more than $600 a kilowatt hour. And then like with Powerwall, like $7,500, let's say it's 15 kilowatt hours, it's actually 13.5 kilowatt hours. 15 kilowatt hours would be $500 per kilowatt hour. But most power most power walls are sold in conjunction with a solar roof or solar panel project. So the revenue is actually significantly higher when you include the solar roof or solar wall, solar uh, solar panels. So I just came up with this rough number of $600 a kilowatt hour as Tesla's revenue for when their battery production. And then we have the what we were just talking about, battery day. Tesla projected that they would produce 100 gigawatt hours of batteries in 2022, and they would produce three terawatt hours of batteries in 2030. And they said that their production would supplement production from their suppliers, particularly LG Chem, CATL, and Panasonic. Mm -hmm. So the napkin math approach is, okay, let's suppose they're going to have 100. Look, we're just doing 2022 for now. Mm -hmm. Let's suppose Tesla is going to produce 100 gigawatt hours of batteries in 2022. And let's say they're going to buy another 100 gigawatt hours of batteries from their suppliers in 2022. So they have a total of 200 gigawatt hours of products in 2022. $600 a kilowatt hour, that's $120 billion in revenue. Their revenue in 2020 was $30 billion. Just those numbers without, and this is without FSD, right? This is without robo-taxi revenue. Just on those numbers, you get to a ballpark of $120 billion in revenue or a 4X increase in revenue in just two years. Take those numbers out to 2030, if you don't mind me going there. Mm -hmm. Three terawatt hours from Tesla, three terawatt hours from suppliers. You've got six terawatt hours of batteries, 6,000 gigawatt hours. That works out to $3.6 trillion in revenue in 2030. That's the napkin math. And then you can say, well, how do you translate that into a market cap? It's hard. And actually, I'm working on a model that I'm not done with yet. I call the margin model, where I'm trying to figure out what what are the margins. I don't like getting more complicated, but I think it makes sense to do a model that's more complicated. But if you said price to sales ratio of eight, which is roughly Apple's price to sales ratio, right? And price to sales ratio, we usually like using price earnings ratios. Price to sales ratio is a little bit touchier. 
Price to sales ratio is affected by, well, what are your margins? What's your growth rate? There's a lot of things that can go into that. But if you just use Apple's price to sales ratio of eight, and you say it's $3 trillion in, in revenue, because I, I came up with $3.6 trillion, mm -hmm. you get to $24 trillion market cap, mm -hmm. right? That's on the battery revenue model. That's leaving out FSD. That's leaving out RoboTaxi. That's leaving out money from AutoBidder. That's leaving out Dojo as a service. There's a lot of other potential revenue and profit stories we haven't talked about. But I get to a $24 trillion market cap with that. Now, mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say, wait a minute, Warren, you're going with $600 per kilowatt hour, which is today. And we would expect that the dollars per kilowatt hour in revenues didn't decline somewhat as we go out to 2030. But really, when I gave you the three trillion number, that's backing it off down to 500. That's backing it off to $500 a kilowatt hour. Well, I would, I mean, I could argue perhaps that that number drops like significantly more than that. I mean, why? Okay, so, um, um, so the, the two main kind of assumptions I'm, I'm picking up is one is the six terawatt hours versus the three that Tesla defined. Um, sure. And I mean, that's up to interpretation because I mean, my, my hunch is, you know, suppliers aren't gonna be able to keep up with how fast Tesla is moving in terms of if Tesla- Wait, 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 wait. wait. Did you see what CATL said they're gonna do? Uh, which is, what did they say? They're gonna, they're gonna produce 1.2 terawatt hours of lithium iron phosphate batteries in 2025. Mm -hmm. Sure. 1.2 terawatt hours of batteries in 2025. Yeah, that's just CATL. That's just 2025. Yeah, I mean, Panasonic. What? Wait, wait, wait. Panasonic oh. and LG Chem are building 48, 4680 cell lines. Who are they building 4680 cell lines for? There's only one customer for 4680 cells. Well, okay. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, the the the, the scope of all that is up to debate. I mean, is unknown for I guess Panasonic, but CATL. They are to me. They are the premier. You know, battery manufacturer outside of Tesla, right? And um, there are they are the choice, the top choice, in my opinion, for a lot of these you know uh, Chinese companies, etc. And so they're going to have a huge amount of demand, you know, from non-Tesla you know um, companies as well. I think, um, I mean, besides CATL, I, I mean, I think CATL will pull their weight, but then the market is huge. You know, there's going to be a, a huge market for batteries, and for I mean. They're gonna Seattle is gonna have you know all the demand they want from from non-Tesla customers as well, and for uh, to expect. I'm not I'm not sure I agree with that. Okay, but I mean what I'm saying who, is who, Tesla. Who are the other who are the other customers who are gonna demand lithium iron phosphate cells from CATO? Like Neo and Xpeng and Li Auto. Okay, so like, they're gonna be Neo, Neo and Xpeng are uh, probably using nickel-based cells because they aren't. They actually lose, using iron phosphate. Yeah, that's okay. what th my understanding is. I, I mean, yeah. I think I think you know you certainly you can look at. Um, uh, I think Volkswagen, here's the problem. If you don't use structural pack, if you don't use the advanced engineering that Tesla is doing to make your vehicles more efficient and you use iron phosphate cells, you don't get the range and you're not able to produce a competitive vehicle. The only way you can use iron phosphate cells is if you're producing vehicles with low range or you're producing vehicles that have advanced engineering that nobody else is doing. Like Neo is premising itself on this battery swap nonsense, which I don't know if you want to dive into that. No, I mean, okay. So I think, I think there's a couple extra steps because for example, Tesla can put lithium iron phosphate into their model three. They can get, you know, decent range, 250 to 300 miles. It's not like, it's just performance might be, you know, might be sacrificed, et cetera. But other car companies like Neo and Xpeng, the auto, they actually have decent engineering, you know, they have their cars, you know, are functional. They might not be at the same level as, as Tesla, They're but functional. you could get, you know, 250, 300 miles, I think in a Neo or Xpeng with lithium iron no. phosphate. There's no, there's no fundamental like physics barrier, first principles barrier for them not to be able to get a decent 250 to 300 mile range in their cars with lithium iron phosphate. I, I, I'm going to disagree with you on that yeah. unless they, unless they go with, so Tesla is probably getting close to 300 miles range on their model three in China. I don't know if they're getting, I don't think they're getting 300 miles range on their model three in China, but Te I think you would agree with me that Tesla's vehicles are engineered better than Neo's and X. I don't, I don't know X Peng well enough. Sure. Uh, Neo is staking itself on this battery swap thing, which you can't do structural pack. Um, so you, you can't do structural pack and do battery swap. Structural pack is something that's going to enable much greater efficiency. Um, that, you know, just for example, I think that we're going to see what happens. This is going to be a really interesting moment when the first Model Y rolls out of Berlin or the first Model Y rolls out of Austin and they weigh it and we find out what the curb weight is on the new Model Y. 
how much less is it going to weigh with front and rear castings and structural battery pack? I think it's going to weigh 500 pounds less. And that translates to a lot more range. It translates to a lot better driving dynamics. It translates to a lot more efficiency. So unless some company comes along and starts doing structural pack and starts doing single piece castings and starts pursuing this relentless approach to efficiency that Tesla is doing, they're not going to be able to do it the same way. They're not going to be able to manufacture vehicles for as low cost. They're not going to be able to deliver the, the, the driving experience that drivers are going to want. They're not going to be able to deliver the low cost per mile that a robo taxi operator is going to want. So there's a lot, there's a lot of hurdles there. And I, you know, the problem with Neo and Xpeng is we don't, you, you probably know more about this than I do. I don't know how much I trust uh, their reporting on what their costs are and what their revenue is, uh, revenue is and their business model. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if there is, I, I think that Tesla is fairly open and honest with, by the standards of Chinese companies, with some exceptions. I'm sure there's some Chinese companies who are better. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think that Neo is that good. I don't think Xpeng is that good that they're gonna be competitive with lithium iron phosphate. They're not gonna be able to deliver the range with that. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I'm sure our viewers will will know more actually on some of the stuff I'm, because I'm sure I'm sure my neo haters, <laughs> the people who love neo and hate me, are probably going to you know send me a bunch of comments about that. Yeah, but, but um, I I do believe I was reading that it was neo or Xpeng was doing lithium iron phosphate with one of their vehicles. I think it might be upcoming, but the range was very good. I think it was close to 300 actually, but we'll see. We'll see. But is that the Chinese? Is that the Chinese measure or the U.S. or the U.K. measure? <laughs> I mean, we'll see. We'll see. I'm not sure exactly, but um. Yeah, I mean, um, but moving on, let's say to the battery revenue model here. Um, so one, that was one angle is the the six ter. I mean, I think to be conservative, we could bring it down to closer to three, or max four, if we wanted to be more conservative. And even that, it's it could be a, a stretch goal in, in a sense, Elon pushing it. Um, there's risk factors of, we don't know whether or not they can actually achieve that. But I give it to you in the sense that, in the battery day presentation, they said three terawatt, terawatt hours by 2030, like not in 2030. So they're right. really trying. I think Elon is saying they have a chance of reaching that before that, a couple of years before that. So, yeah, they seem confident. Um, but the, the, the second kind of assumption that, that I see in the battery revenue model is not just the $600 per kilowatt hour revenue and moving down to 500, but like, I think the Tesla energy side could massively bring that down. Depends on what percent of revenue comes from Tesla revenue. But if we split it up, like move auto away, and let's say half or even more than half goes to Tesla energy of that, let's say hypothetically, let's use three ter terawatt hours. Like I was, I was talking to Matt Smith, the Spark spread earlier today, and yeah. he was saying kind of he he sees potential with Tesla energy and power walls in residential mostly. Um, mm -hmm. He says that's where the economics are, but he's saying there has to be some major like price cuts, like to the point where he was saying, you know, if they could do something like a 140, you know, kilowatt hour, whatever power pack for, you know, $10,000 or something where you could really have a, like you talking, talking about for the home. Yeah. For the home. Right. And you can have, you know, power backup power for a week and it's really cheap. Like basically if you can have 10 power walls, you know, of today's power, you know, I think each power wall is like 14 kilowatt hours right now, but if you can have like 10 of those for the price of, you know, one or two or so, then you're going to see the demand pick up to the point where the demand could possibly um, reach that over one terawatt hour mark. And in his opinion, he says, if there isn't this drastic price cut, then like there's no way that Tesla can use all of that for Tesla energy. It's just it, it, the, the economics aren't there. So hypothetically, let's say uh, Tesla does aggressive move with Tesla energy to really on power walls, drop the price of, you know, all of this stuff. And let's say they get their batteries down to $40, you know, per kilowatt hour and let's say their, their cost or their or their sale price let's say their cost hypothetically yeah. I, okay. I think that's the i think that's where lithium iron phosphate goes the problem is everything i've seen power well is going to be nickel based but go ahead yeah um but let's say off of that 40 dollars per kilowatt hour let's say i mean in my opinion like if if Tesla gets that cost, there's going to be others who get around that cost because you have CATL and others people producing at scale already. So, you know, if you're going to charge, let's say, double $40, let's say, 
you know, you charge $80 per kilowatt hour or something. Um, even with charging $80 per kilowatt hour as a sale price, you know, you, you still have a lot of expenses. You have, you know, the expense to, to make the power wall, you have the operating expenses, the R and D, et cetera. You might be lucky to scrape by $10 of profit per kilowatt hour. Um, so hypothetically, let's say we use a terawatt hour, you know, just as an example, because it could be more than one terawatt hour, but per terawatt hour, you get $10 of profit per kilowatt hour. And then if you do megawatt hour per one megawatt hour, you get $10,000 profit gigawatt hour, you get $10 million of profit and terawatt hour, you get $10 billion of profit per terawatt hour. In this case, this is you know, I mean, it's not chump change, you know, $10 billion of, of, of pure profit, but you give, you know, let's say a 50 times multiple off of that, you know, um, that's only 500 billion. Yep. Yep. No, that's, that's a lot smaller. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. so, so what's, what's going on? Like, um, why is there such a big discrepancy here if we sure. calculate so off of kilowatt hour? So you have to understand that there's a key detail. First of all, I don't I don't think that you're going to have a 140 kilowatt hour pack in your house, especially not a lithium iron phosphate. Lithium iron phosphate batteries or iron phosphate batteries are volumetrically challenged, right? They're they're mass challenged. Mm -hmm. They have lower energy density by mass, and they also have, they're even worse on volume. So I think the reason that Tesla is sticking with some kind of nickel-based chemistry for Powerwall is because they just take up too much space if you use iron phosphate. They're too heavy and they take up too much space. So um, I, I think you're correct in this sense. And, and LG Chem is a great example. I think LG Chem is a competitor of Tesla in providing something like Powerwall. I think CATL probably could be a competitor in providing a product like Powerwall. Um, you have this issue, which is what's their marketing strategy? How are, you know, is Tesla, it's, think about this, Apple and uh, LG, whatever, they both sell cell phones, right? For some reason, te Apple makes a lot more profit on its phones than the competitors. Mm -hmm. tell, me if I'm, tell me if you think I'm wrong about that. I think I'm correct <laughs> that Apple makes uh -huh. a lot more profit on their phones. So why does Apple make a lot more profit on their phones? Well, it has a brand. It has software that people appreciate. I mean, I have... I have an iPhone right here, right? Mm -hmm. um, the camera's amazing. Mm -hmm. I personally think the rest of the phone is not as impressive in some ways as people think, but people are addicted to the Apple iOS yeah. and, and Apple makes a premium profit on its products. So Tesla is not going to have to market as much as other people because they have a network of vehicle buyers and robo-taxi users to market to directly. Um, I actually think Megapack I thought you were gonna, I thought you were going to go a different way on this. I think Megapack, I think the grid level util, the utility grid storage is actually going to be bigger than Powerwall. When I when I do my own models, mm -hmm. I struggle to come up with big numbers for Powerwall and solar roof and solar panels. Uh, it may be possible, but I just, you know, I I just don't end up coming with big numbers. I come mm -hmm. up with much bigger numbers for Megapack. And Megapack is similarly challenged in the sense that Already, Megapack is only about three hundred dollars revenue per kilowatt hour. They're, you know, it's like nine hundred. I think it's nine hundred thousand dollars official price for a Megapack. I think they sometimes sell them for less. And if you figure three megawatt hours, they use their plan to use lithium iron phosphate for Megapack. So three megawatt hours, you get about one hundred twenty thousand dollar cost for the cells. So you figure, all right, it's one hundred. This is where the margins come in, right? You figure with all the other stuff, it costs one hundred fifty thousand dollars to make a Megapack. And you're charging nine hundred thousand for it. Maybe you come down to to seven fifty, right? When you're selling it in volume or you're selling it in a part of a deal, you're still making high margins, but the revenue per kilowatt hour is actually a lot less, mm -hmm. right? Because nine hundred thousand on a three on a three megawatt hour device yeah. only works up to three hundred dollars per kilowatt hour. So that's why the margins matter a lot. And then the question is: Is somebody else going to come up with a system? Because Megapack isn't just a box, right? There's auto bidder software that goes with it. There's there, there's a whole engineered system there. And as far as I know, no one else has come up with something comparable to what Megapack does. And then the other side of it is, are you able to produce it in scale? So, and I, you know, it's like this, this Apple branding thing doesn't help you with Megapack necessarily, right? I mean, it can help you in the business world. If you remember back, cause you're, I don't think you're as old as me, but if you go, I don't know how old you are, no offense, <laughs> but uh, I'm 55. If you go back, it used to be, well, did you go with Microsoft? Did you go with IBM? There was this sense in the business world that you had to buy IBM, you had to buy Microsoft. And it took Dell forever 
to crack into that, to get in there. You had to have Intel. It took AMD forever to get in there. So if Tesla becomes the go-to brand for the corporate world, for the utility world, then they're, able, they're going to be able to get bigger margins on their products than a competitor who comes in. So I can't say this again, we can't see the future. I'm just looking at it saying, well, Tesla's got the brand cachet that they're going to get a higher profit margin on their products than their competitors. Mm -hmm. Tesla has the network. They're building this network of consumers that are going to be more likely support. I mean, they're not trying to, they, I don't know if you realize this, they just raised the price of solar roof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like substantially. Yeah, yeah. And I have a solar roof on order, and like as far as I know, my price is protected. Yeah, same here. <laughs> um, but you know, why did they raise the price? They didn't raise the price because they had a shortage of demand, right? And I, I ordered three power walls. That, that they didn't lower the, the, the if they haven't lowered the price of power wall yet. There's a lot of demand for these products right now. What's really hard for us to see is how much demand is there. I was talking to my neighbor. You know, yeah. I live in South Florida where. You just went through it in Texas. I don't know if you were affected, but yeah, yeah. There, there was a power outage. A lot of people were affected. All of a sudden, it's like, gee, I might like having some power walls. So I was just talking to my neighbor. He's like, you know, I got this big south-facing roof. He he already has a relatively new roof, so he might do solar panels and, and power walls. And he loves the idea. So I think there's a lot of people who are going to jump on this. And really, Tesla's biggest hurdle has never been demand. Their biggest hurdle has always been supply and, you know, getting this, the material so they can produce in volume. So I think I'm giving you a long winded answer to your question. I think your, your margins, the margins that you're giving Tesla on these products is, is far lower than they're sure. going to earn. Sure. And for the same, for the same reason that Apple makes outsized margins. Yeah. I mean, I think that's you know, definitely a valid point. I think um, a couple additional points is like when I was talking to, to Matt Smith, the spark spread earlier today, he was saying how he just doesn't see the unit economics work out that well for utility. And he says like, there are certain projects that work out very favorably, like Hornsdale, et cetera, but there aren't that many of them. And he says, the more you put mega packs on the grid, actually it reduces the available kind of profitable you know, opportunities over time. And so it actually, he's not as bullish on utility. Um, the second thing is what's interesting about. Oh, wait, let me let, let me okay. just address that. Yeah. So I agree with him with the current grid, mm. with the current sources of power generation, but as the grid goes to more solar production, as the grid goes to more wind, because there's a there's at least a, a sense mm -hmm. that we're going to stop using fossil fuels to power power. I I have a friend who works in um, for a, a major company that makes uh, natural gas powered electric generation facilities, the lar the largest ones. 10 years ago, I was talking, it's like, oh, solar is never going to catch up. We charge, we cost so much less per, per megawatt hour, whatever. They're never going to be able to catch us. I was talking to him like a week ago. He's like, yeah, they caught us. <laughs> it's like, it's like, there's no, there's no future for, for building natural gas power plants. There's no mm -hmm. future for building coal or other power plants. Solar and wind are going to dominate. And now you're going to have the problem of storing the energy at night. You're going to see so, massive solar farms. You're going to see massive wind farms. And that's where you're going to need mega packs. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Um, the, the, Another point about kind of the Apple and iPhone analogy, which I think has some, perhaps some, some holes, which is with Apple, the big thing with iOS is the network effects where each additional user that Apple gains, it adds, it makes the better, the whole, entire experience better because it's more demand for the say apps, developers make more money, they make better apps. It's hard to have 10 competing app stores, you know, and for example, companies aren't going to make more than like, you know, I iOS and Android version, like to, to make a third and fourth version of the game or their app is just, is, is incredibly difficult. And in the same way, um, or when you apply it to Tesla energy, that network effect, for example, with having a power wall or having a utility grid mega pack isn't as strong. Because, I agree. yeah, it, it's not necessarily like the software thing where you're aggregating, you know, everyone together to make the overall product better. I mean, there is some brand, obviously, recognition that makes the whole bureaucratic process of enterprise sales to utility go quicker and faster. And maybe ancillary uh, kind of adjacent products that Tesla can compare it with, like what you're saying, auto bidder or with the residential customer like your solar panels and your car and everything integrated, but it's not as strong. And that, that's why I think with the Tesla energy side, Tesla ultimately will, they do need to compete on price, you know, and they, and there's going to be a lot of players. There, there are already a lot of players. All these people are, are offering 
energy storage, like CATL and like all these people, they, they have their eyes set on it too. And so it's going to be a massive, you know, battle to the bottom. Yeah. And, no, and, and I, would, I would expect, for example, CATL is likely to succeed in China. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. They're, they're going to be favored by the Chinese government. True. And I mean, but yeah, and the supply, though, is also going to make its way you know, to, to others and they, and they could set up a, a U.S. operation too, but well, I mean, we, did you, did you watch Biden's speech? Yeah, I did. Huh? We're, we're not going to be getting CATL <laughs> mega packs in the United States. You know, we're not, we're, I don't, I don't agree by the way. I well, don't, I don't uh, believe that this is proper for the U S government yeah. to discriminate against foreign products. Uh -huh. I'm a free trade guy. And I think yeah. the world trade organization rules prohibit what, what he said, but they're going to do it anyway. Yeah. Um, so I think they're going to favor domestic production of anything that's going to shore up the grid. And as far as I know, the only domestic producer of products that are going to shore up the grid is Tesla. Yeah. I mean, actually, one other angle is a domestic company can buy CATL cells, right? And assemble no, no, it into mega packs. Yes. That, right? Because the, the, the global see, supply chain is so diverse, you know? So you run into another problem, which is there's, mm -hmm. a, there, there's an advantage in being the largest player. Mm -hmm. Right. You have you have economies of scale that other competitors don't have. Um, so I think there's going to be a challenge for somebody to come along and compete. If Tesla is the let's let's suppose Tesla achieves being the largest player, at least in the United States in products like Megapack and somebody else comes along and says, hey, I'm going to build my own utility grade utility grade uh, grid storage device. They're going to lose money trying to catch up to Tesla and Tesla's, you know, one of the things we know about Tesla is they're always working on lowering their own costs. Right. So, you know, there's there's also there's actually we, this is going off an extreme, but don't be surprised if Tesla's doing some battery research that's going to lower their costs ahead of everyone else. We don't we don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They got some smart people there. Yeah. Yeah. So, but but I, I think you're correct. I, I agree with you. It's not like this in App Store. I was going to say the reason we have iPhones, we had Android before. Yeah. My wife couldn't participate in iMessage with her friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we had it's to terrible. get iPhones so my wife could participate in iMessage with her friends. Like the text messaging doesn't work because Apple broke the the, the text messaging standard, mm -hmm. and we got iPhones because of that. Yeah. So that you know that there there is an advantage there. I don't think that advantage is strong for Tesla, but I think the brand advantage might be stronger. Yeah, I mean the brand advantage obviously is there, but I'm, like already a ton of companies are making like energy storage. I think Neo just came out with a, a line of, of utility grade um, energy storage. Yeah, Lucid. Don't forget Lucid I mean, Motors. Lucid Motors is going to make them too. I think, uh, yeah. I think LG Chem has, you know, their own power walls, et cetera. LG Chem, real, LG Chem yeah. definitely has it. Yeah. LG Chem's for and I guess what I'm saying is I think there's a, a decent chance that this is a race to the bottom, a price war. And, and a price war that Tesla wants to participate in because it's a worthwhile effort to you know, move the world to sustainable energy. Thus, in Tesla and Elon's mind, it's okay if mega packs and power walls aren't that profitable because it helps them first to get economies of scale with battery, so they could drive down battery prices, so they may make money on the auto front, but also it moves the envelope to, you know, bring the world to sustainable energy. So in a way, Tesla is willing to play the price war, but I don't know, a lot of businesses just aren't high, bus high margin businesses. They're just not attractive. That's why, for example, Apple and Google and Amazon aren't interested in the energy storage business because it's so large. It's ultimately it's not a high margin tech type of software well, or that type of business, right? I guess I would respond that if it, if it became such a low margin business, it would make sense for Tesla to stop making integrated storage products because there's no profit in it and take their resources and focus on where they're making margin. So they would focus more on vehicles and they would focus on something like you know, maybe ships, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've always had this question, you know, cause Elon has talked about shipping should go to battery electric. Mm -hmm. I don't know how the heck I've, I've done the math on it. It doesn't make sense unless you do something like structural battery hull, but uh -huh. you know, unless you make the hull out of batteries, yeah. I don't see how it works, but if they use too much volume, that the batteries use too much volume mm -hmm. for the ships, that's the way I see it. So it would not make sense to continue in that market if your margins were that low, if you're able to generate much higher margins in another business. So my hunch is mm -hmm. they're still going to be able to command significant margins in the in the grid storage business, and the especially in the power wall end of the business. Mm -hmm. Because if you're deploying solar roofs and solar panels and you have this built-in customer base from Tesla vehicle owners mm -hmm. and you have low marketing expenses and people are naturally going to go to you, and they are the lowest cost solar panel provider in America, right? Mm -hmm. And no one else is producing 
power wall type devices at scale. So I think they may get, but you know, I think you're right. If somebody came in, here's the problem. Like if you think about it, a power wall, let's say, let's say we're talking about power wall. Let's say the power wall is made with iron phosphate cells and they're $40 per kilowatt hour. And then you have a 15, let's say a 15 kilowatt hour power wall, which is a little bigger than it really is. Mm -hmm. Then it's only $600 for the cells. You're probably producing the power walls at scale for a thousand dollars. So right now they're selling them for 7,500. Maybe they come down to 5,000. They're making 80% margin. So somebody else has to come in mm -hmm. and be able to produce them at scale and get the cost significantly below $5,000. So maybe somebody does that. You know, maybe CATL is able to pull that off. Maybe uh, LG Chem is able to swing that. Um, but I haven't seen them yet. You know, where are they? Because there's a huge margin on these devices, right? Well, that's, that's the other thing is at $7,500 or $8,000 or $8, for a 14 kilowatt hour, maybe the demand isn't as high, you know, as it could be, obviously, if it was much, much cheaper. Or you could get, you know, five times the amount well, of, of well, what you're saying, power. What you're saying is even right now with the cost of LFP, CATL could make power walls. They're probably paying $60 a kilowatt hour for the, you know. Yeah. They could do a power wall for 2,500 bucks, right? Massively undersell Tesla and, and do it. So why... That, you know, why aren't they doing it? I think the reason is because making that device in a way that's user friendly, mm -hmm. that, that is appealing, that's reliable, I think it's harder than it looks. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of intellectual property in Tesla's grid storage products and Powerwall products that we don't see. And it's not as easy to emulate as we think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's, I mean, in one angle, I, I totally get that because there is the whole package that Tesla offers, you know, it's like just sign the contract. We'll set you up with everything, you know, um, both on the commercial or utility side and the residential side, you know, you don't have to deal with all these multiple companies and providers and it's like the all in one solution. But on the flip side, when I look out five or 10 years, any lucrative market is going to have a ton of players. And unless there's something inherent about that market that allows for high, extremely high margins, oftentimes you know, it, it becomes a crowded market. I mean, that's why there's not a ton of super high margin trillion dollar markets out there. You know, it's just, there's, it's, it's a rare thing. You know, a lot of things are yep. price are driven the, down. The competition, um, if you build it, the competition will come. Yeah, exactly. And even if Tesla makes low margin in their, or no margin even, but super low margin, let's say in, in their energy side, it makes sense still because it subsidizes their auto business because the cells for their vehicles become that much cheaper because they're producing in such mass quantity. You know, like you're making two or three times perhaps the, the, the cells you would have made before, right? And that therefore that's got to reduce the cost of the cells tremendously. You know, imagine I'm, if you're making, you know, I don't know, like imagine if you're making two tel ter terawatt hours versus one terawatt hour. I mean, you're, you're going to have that much more, you know, economies of scale, which, which, which helps your, 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 your vehicle size. So it makes sense. I mean, even if it's, I mean, it could be, it could be decent margin. I'm just saying it's unclear to me that, that, you know, if, if I were to place the odds, I would place the odds more to low margin to, you know, okay margin. And high margin is, is a lower possibility, in my opinion, at least longer term. The longer you go out, the high margin becomes lower in possibility. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Well, the one thing I would say is, you know, the three terawatt hours that Tesla talked about, <clears throat> that's supposed to be the high nickel cells. And the high nickel cells are not going in grid storage and they're not going in power wall. So the, the batteries that Tesla's making are going in Tesla Semi and they're going in the, the Cybertruck primarily. And they're going in, you know, Plaid Plus, which is a very low volume vehicle, Robotax, uh, Roadster, which is a very low volume vehicle. Mm -hmm. So unless Tesla expands their battery production beyond high nickel cells, which <clears throat> Elon said they're not, right? Elon said they're only going to make the high nickel cells. And I think they're, I think they're helping LG Chem and Panasonic make the, the nickel manganese cells they talked about. <clears throat> but if they make three terawatt hours of high nickel cells, what are they doing with them? Right? I mean, <clears throat> that could be the semi market entirely. And, you know, cyber, semi and Cybertruck maybe uses all of that. But they're not going in Megapack. So that the idea that making those cells in volume, uh, that doesn't connect with the with the the 
with the Tesla energy side of the market because Tesla energy is primarily using iron phosphate. Yeah, but I mean, did Elon didn't, <clears throat> did he, he didn't box Tesla in to say that they won't make iron phosphate, lithium iron phosphate cells. He didn't in the say future, they right? won't, but yeah. at, least, at least initially they're only making the high nickel cells. Yeah, I mean, to and, me, Tesla's like, they're, they're chemistry agnostic. They'll do what makes sense, you know, and they'll change over time. You know, the chemistries can change as well. I think there's a question about what's, we don't know what research is going on in Tesla skunk works, right? Mm -hmm. We know, we believe that lithium iron phosphate is going to get down to around $40 a kilowatt hour in cost, like CATL. I think the problem is that um, unless Tesla has some like home run battery technology we don't know about, like they're going to develop solid state before everyone else, mm -hmm. or they're going to come up with a solid state iron phosphate cell or something, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, um, I guess I would go with the, the idea that if, if a market became so competitive that Tesla wasn't making significant margins and other people were meeting the demand, um, they, that they were convert, shifting the market to the sustainable energy, then Tesla doesn't need to do that anymore. It's not furthering the mission to participate in that competition anymore. They need to focus on where else you need to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy, like shipping, mm -hmm. I can maybe see mass transit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't see them staying in, in energy if it becomes so competitive they're not making margin. Not so much because they're not making margin. I mean, on the one hand, because we're not making profits on this anymore, we shouldn't waste our time on it. And the other hand, the mission was to accelerate the transition. We did it. Yeah. We accelerated the transition there. They're doing fine. They don't need us anymore. Yeah. You know, um, um, one of the reasons why I cannot um, uh, discount completely like a uh, – aggressive or high margin battery business in some ways because I've always had this thought, this is back like 2013 or 2014, that if Tesla could ramp the Model 3 and, and then get another generation, like a cheaper model as well, Gen 4 car, car as I called it back then, and eventually, and if they can scale, eventually they can get to a place, and I always pinned it in like the mid to late 2020s, they can get to a place where possibly they achieve a true energy breakthrough. Something that only can happen if you have like, you know, the, the size of, of like, I don't know, you know, 70, 80% of all of, you know, the battery, you know, production in the world. You have all of that revenue, but the profit, you have just like, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars that you can pour into research. And you have someone like Elon just pushing the envelope where, you know, right now they're just doing a lot of cost reduction, et cetera, but there isn't necessarily a true energy breakthrough in a sense of maybe a different, completely approach, a di different approach or something, you, mean, you know? Are you talking about the, the energy generation or the energy storage? Uh, energy storage. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it may, it may very well be that in Tesla skunk works, they're working on some advanced battery technology we haven't seen. Yeah. But in, in my kind of theory, since, you know, many years ago, the, the idea is, they get so much profit and they don't know what to do with it. They have to pour it into R&D. It gets to this place where at some point they're so far ahead of the, the, the crowd with R&D and they, they're investing so much money into true breakthrough that they achieve a breakthrough. I'm not saying it's 100%. I give it like maybe a 30 or 40% chance, but they ach achieve a true energy breakthrough that can't be copied. It, it really is like something only Tesla could do. And in that case, it changes the whole ball game because no matter what anyone else does, they just can't compete in terms of this energy breakthrough because they didn't put in that all that work. And so then it's up to Tesla to either license it, to sell it, or to maybe they're just out of the good heart of their mission, just you know, give away the, the, the patents. I don't know. But um, that's an interesting. It's always been kind of in the back of my mind as a, a decently you know, probable event in the late maybe mid to late 2020s or so. Um, yeah. So anyways, that's one of the reasons why I think um, uh, Tesla Energy, we don't know what's yeah. going to happen. But Let, me, know, let me just address happen. that. One of the things, when people talk about battery research, they primarily talk about um, energy density, like in watt hours per kilogram. And I actually think cost per kilowatt hour is actually much more significant. So if somebody came out with a battery, you know, next year that was a thousand watt hours per kilogram, but it was expensive. You don't need it in a car, right? You're, you're already able to deliver adequate range with the batteries we have now. You, so like there's all this talk about solid state and quantum scape and they're gonna come up with some yeah. great battery. 
that you you know, whether they're gonna be able to manufacture at scale, but there's, there's this big question with any new battery technology, can you lower the cost per kilowatt hour? And if you, if there was a slide at battery day where they compared the cost of iron versus the cost of nickel, right? And you know, nickel is this, it's harder to get nickel, it costs more. So I would say if you are pursuing an area of research and you wanted to, to move the needle, what you really wanna do is you wanna find a way to manufacture iron phosphate cells at scale at lower cost that that would be a, a bigger needle mover. You know, maybe you increase the energy density a little, but that's where the real potential gain is, is getting the cost per kilowatt hour down. Because, you know, right now, uh, Elon has said they're going to get their nickel cells down to around $60 a kilowatt hour. And it's not just Elon, Drew Baglino said the same thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that the expectation is that iron phosphate cells are going to drop to $40 a kilowatt hour, yeah. that they're always going to be cheaper. So the question is, could you drive, you know, how low could you drive the cost of iron phosphate cells? Right. Could you drive them to twenty dollars a kilowatt hour? Could you come up with some technology that drives them to ten dollars a kilowatt hour? Because the materials in iron phosphate cells are so cheap. Yeah, but I mean, are they cheaper than really, you know, ten or twenty dollars per kilowatt hour? Though, I mean, I, I haven't looked iron, into the math iron, myself. But iron is, but it, it was on this. It was on one of their slides. It's like yeah. iron is so much cheaper than nickel. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I don't think phosphate phosphate like almost costs nothing, right? I mean, you know, mm. the the difference between manganese and nickel versus iron and phosphate. I don't know what else goes in an iron phosphate cell. That's my point is just that what, what you were talking about, that yeah. that the driver would be, can you get the cost down rather than, because yeah. everybody talks about energy density. Shirley Mung talks about energy density. They're trying to get 500 watt hours per kilogram, which matters for aviation, but I don't know how much it matters for cars. Yeah, no, I agree. I, th I think the, the, the big push over the next five or 10 years is to you know obviously get the cost per kil kil kilowatt hour down. I think what I'm referring to is on top of that, there could be kind of like this option call that Tesla has to invest into some completely different approach, you know, to even energy storage that, you know, seems kind of crazy, but you mean, you mean not batteries, um, maybe a different type of battery. Maybe it's not even lithium, you know, maybe it's a completely different, you know, substance, um, you know, um, Elon's done a ton of work with supercapacitors. Who knows? There could be supercapacitors. There yeah. could be a, a, a whole host of different things that are, are, are a different angle, you know, that approach it from a different way. And if Tesla can put hundreds of billions of dollars of research development into this over a long period of time, it you can't. It's hard to to say that they can't achieve a breakthrough. You know what I'm saying? Like if any yeah. company in the in the history can achieve a breakthrough in energy storage, you know, in a different way, it, it possibly could be Tesla in the next maybe 10 years or well, so. Well, let me say I see things a little differently. So let me just mm. say where I think where I think this goes. I think that they are basically solving the problem of trans of it's going to take time, but they they are basically succeeding in accelerating the transition to sustainable transportation. And I think we can see that we are successfully accelerating the transition to sustainable energy generation and energy storage. But those things are already basically happening. And I think I have this image of Elon that he's going to stay in this game for another five years or so. Mm -hmm. And as long as he sees that Tesla's on the right path, I wouldn't be surprised if Elon walks away from Tesla saying, OK, this job is done. Mm -hmm. Right. I want to he's going to focus on Mars. He's going to focus on Neuralink or the two, those are the two babies. Yeah. We didn't really talk about Boring Company much. I think Boring Company is going to help in this um, shift to sustainable transportation. Uh, but I think he, to some extent, at some point, he's able to walk away from Tesla and just, you know, cash his dividend checks to fund Mars. And yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I think there's some potential breakthrough out there. I just can't envision it. And, you know, if you look at their slides from Battery Day, all their plans are relying on batteries. And I think... Mm -hmm. You've achieved, if the goal was to shift the world off oil and gas and off fossil fuels, I think five to 10 years from now, we're going to say mission accomplished anyway, whether we have some breakthrough or not, mm -hmm. right? Solar, solar is already getting cheaper in generation and wind is already getting cheaper in generation. Battery storage is already cheap enough to facilitate solar and wind. Yeah. I don't know if another breakthrough is needed. As yeah. opposed to where breakthroughs are really needed in like Neuralink and, and getting to Mars. Yeah, I mean, here's another completely uh, out there angle. Maybe Mars will actually need that breakthrough in energy storage. I mean, because if you think about it, like maybe you have, you know, I don't know. It, it just, I mean, maybe transporting a bunch of, you know, 
<laughs> mega packs or something to to Mars is fine. But if you could actually find a true breakthrough that just radically transforms energy storage and and even energy generation. I mean, solar panels are great, but you know, I mean, the potential for Tesla though to have hundreds of billions of dollars to to fork into you know potentially revolutionary technologies. I mean, that's the ultimate in sense question long term for the investors. Like, fine. Robo taxis work, vehicles work, you know, power walls work. But what is Tesla going to do with all this extra cash flow? You know, like where is it going to go? And I think of anything, you don't, you don't, you don't think it's just going into dividend checks. I mean, that's part of it, but it's going to be so massive. It's like you're going to have a ton left over. You know, like to to so put here, to something. Here's my concern about that. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we have a very successful corporation like Xerox. Right. And then Xerox had the Palo Alto Research Center, Xerox Park. Mm. Um, a lot of times you have these companies. Google has, you know, all these I forget what they call it. They have some sort of big research arm that trying to and they end up not accomplishing very much most of the time. It's yeah. like funny. Xerox Park came up with the mouse, mm -hmm. but they didn't commercialize it themselves. Mm. Right. They came up with the graphical user interface on the mouse, but they didn't they didn't. So I don't know that that's the best investment of shareholder capital to go into that. For Tesla, I'm not saying it isn't. I yeah, just don't know. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's it's sort of like the company gets to a certain point where they have so much money, and there's somebody in the R and D department that says, "Hey, we got all this money. Give me some money to do a research project." And I think as long as Elon's at the helm, it's not going to happen. Yeah, because Elon's not going to waste money unless he sees it. Yeah. Um. So, but you know, when Elon steps away, which he said he's committed for the next several years, so six, seven years. When Elon steps away, then a lot of things are possible. I just don't know that it, the money will be well spent in that way. I think that you get the most innovation out of startups who have new ideas. Yeah. I mean, I totally see that. Actually, I see it a little bit different in the sense that as long as Elon is at the helm, any money spent into R&D makes sense because Elon knows how to spend it. Like he's always seeing things from first principles. And so, right. you know, he'll only research or pour into investments into things that he thinks has a probable probable path to some type of, you know, innovation or improvement, et cetera. But I think um like you're notice noting like for example, Google has their, you know, their bets, big bets, you know, division and Google X or whatever. And and a lot of companies and even Apple is kind of stuck in some type of stagnation with a ton of money, but what are they completely doing with it? Um, I think that's that makes sense for companies that don't have a generational innovator as a leader, you know, like who's at Google really making those innovative decisions, you know, it's like, or who's at Apple making those innovative decisions. It's like, you just don't have the, right. the, the, the top helm doing that. But I think a better example is perhaps like Edison, where you had so much innovation happening because he was in charge, you know, yeah. of his labs. And I kind of see that possible with Elon at Tesla, as long as Elon's in charge, the the amount of innovation that comes out of, for example, we have full self-driving now with AI, but what's next? Like, are we just going right, to so use, are we just going to use everything that we built with full self-driving, all of the neural net right. experience, the compute, the new, the hardware, all this stuff and just stop and just make incremental improvements? Well, no, 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 no. With so, full self-driving so, later on. So first of all, we haven't talked about this. I yeah. see the RoboTaxi network being spun off in an IPO. Mm -hmm. The RoboTaxi network gets spun off in an IPO. It generates massive cash. Um, mm. You know, Tesla still owns 25% of it. Elon still owns 25% of it or something like that. I mean, or what's, 10 the, of what's the point, though? It, it, I mean, you're getting the same cash in terms of cash flow at, by owning the company, right? Like you, the only benefit of spinning it out is you might get a higher okay. market cap valuation, but that's it. But that doesn't benefit so here's, Tesla. Here's, here, I have a different view of Elon. Mm. My view of Elon is he believes his role is to solve problems. Mm -hmm. And once the robo taxi network is solved, he doesn't have a problem he needs to solve anymore. Once you've, you've got Tesla to the point where it's successfully accelerated the transition to sustainable energy and, you know, he's not he's not in it to become the wealthiest man in the world. Yeah, he doesn't mind becoming the wealthiest man in the world, but that's not why he's there. He, he is focused on using his bandwidth where it matters most and managing a robo taxi network that already works well and, you know, incrementally improving profits of the robo taxi network and incrementally moving money around to engage in wild research projects that don't go anywhere is not necessarily his thing. It's very clear to me that Elon has two major goals once Tesla is, is has achieved its mission. The major goals are Mars and Neuralink. Um, SpaceX, 
Mars expands humanity into space and Neuralink expands human consciousness and helps us keep up with AI. Now, I think Dojo as a service, I think applying, I think he's he probably is interested in how can we use the AI features of Dojo to do something. But I, I just think fundamentally, they will, they have almost already solved the transportation problem. The robo taxis and EVs together basically solve the transportation problem and gains after that aren't that big. You know, he, he's always looking for a, ten, where can I make a 10X or 100X improvement in something? And once the robo taxi network is running on efficient electric vehicles, there's not that much gain left for him to achieve. And his bandwidth is better focused on things where the bandwidth is valuable, like establishing a Mars colony, like making Neuralink work, and maybe like <laughs> finding a way to be ready for when AGI happens for the yeah, singularity. Yeah, sure. Like actually you and I, I, we're not actually that far off because I, I do think in a lot of the similar ways where um, Elon could be moving on from Tesla in five years or so um, to focus on Mars and Neuralink. I mean, it makes sense in a lot of ways because it's like, hey, if Tesla is doing well, you know, mission is on the way to be accomplished, he could focus on, other things that need more help, you know? Um, and, and, but the problem or the challenge with that is, I mean, it could, it's, it'll, it could work out either way, but one of the challenges is now you have this big company of Tesla without Elon and you don't have that innovator pushing everything. So the expectations for Tesla really to reinvent themselves and whatever, or go into massive new industries is it, you have to taper that, right? It's, it's more of a traditional company now that's going to just try to grow their current existing market share in transportation or energy or right. whatever, right? Um, right. Somewhere, somewhere after 2030, somewhere around 2030 or after it stops becoming a rapid growth company. Exactly. Um, At some point it's, 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 it's reached enough of the market and maybe some competitors have come along or whatever. And Tesla becomes a somewhat normal. I think it's after 2030, but at some point yeah. it becomes a more normal company. Exactly. But I think like Apple. Like yeah. Not, not crazy normal, exactly, but yeah. like Apple. Yeah. yeah. But I think there there is a divergent sprout of a possibility. I'm not saying this is like the most probable or the most likely or even people want it per se. I'm saying there's a, there's a slight possibility that, you know, imagine what if Elon stuck around with Tesla and was able to funnel all of the AI experience and foundation that they've had to new problems, you know, and, you know, it could be, you know, it could be stuff that's related to the sustainable energy mission of Tesla. I mean, for example, I don't know, if, if you solve the entire logistics chain from, from boat to semi to warehouse, warehouse uh, robots to robo taxi van to drone or robot to the porch like if you solve that entire chain of transportation you're making a huge dent in you know the sustainable energy of the world yes. you know and like a lot of ai could be applied to that or for example like i mean not even ai but there's other areas for example like the the tesla home like you know you have heating that's, that's, that's AC. a big one i'm excited about yeah you have Tes yeah you have so much energy that's used you know to I mean, yeah, I'm trying to like, what, what about home building? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, home building, et cetera, all this stuff where without Elon, I don't know if, if Tesla's really going to get into these areas and even if they want to, I don't know how successful they are. I mean, it takes someone like Elon to pull off something like the solar roof. Like it's such an immensely complex pro product. I can't imagine another CEO. Maybe there is, but no, I, I agree with you on that. You know what I'm saying? It's so that. complex that. But it, then the challenge is, well, what's the next thing that needs to be to be solved. Like, yeah. like I think like applying Dojo's learning, machine learning to, because I think you may have talked about this with James Doma, mm -hmm. but applying Dojo's machine learning to robotics so that robots yeah, can yeah, exactly. the world around them, which, which, which is a harder problem than driving. That they, they experience more edge cases, mm -hmm. right? They will experience, you know, different environments that, that vehicles don't do, but Dojo is getting there. I, I definitely think there's some room for Dojo to solve problems that I haven't thought of. Mm -hmm. Right. But yeah. it's, that's actually the big question is, well, what problems haven't we thought of? Yeah, I don't know definitely. the answer to that. Maybe, maybe robots building homes. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I, I actually think I feel I feel yeah. like, well, there's I mean, there's there's so many different things you can improve, like like green steel or green concrete or, you know. Like housing is still really expensive, right? Yeah. Is yeah. there a way you could come up with like actually I have this whole theory yeah. that um, the the you have these robo minibuses 
right, that, mm -hmm. that have sleeper configurations. And instead of bothering to... Um, One moment. What the hell was that? <laughs> I don't know. Siri went off on me. Um, <laughs> instead of bothering to stay, live in a house, mm -hmm. you, you adopt like a nomad lifestyle and you just go to one city and you have fun all day and then you hop in a robo bus, a sleeper robo bus, and it costs you less than a hotel room or, or even owning a home. And how many people, because you know about van life, right? What if it was yeah, like yeah. robo van life? Yeah, yeah. You know, and you're, yeah. you're just like, they're like youth hostels on wheels. Yeah. I mean, who knows where that could go? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, if Tesla makes an RV, it's just one more, it's just, it's so similar to a house because, I mean, Tesla's already making the roof. And to make a roof that's so complex that it actually is, Part of your energy system along right. with your power walls and all that and then elon has publicly stated that they want to make an hvac system so you've got yep. your heating and your air conditioning probably what's left you've got your plumbing right um perhaps and the and your structure sewer, and the structure right? of the house yeah exactly there's not much left in the house yeah. you know and, and they're um, already building and they're already involved in building factories yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I wonder, do you think um, Starbase, do you think Tesla will do anything at Starbase or do you think Tesla will build any houses next to their Austin factory? I, I read a video about it. I think the Tesla mm -hmm. should get into the home building industry. I don't mm -hmm. know that they will. I, I think, I think there's one of those questions is suppose you're Elon Musk. Okay. I realize there's more people there than just Elon, but suppose you're Elon Musk and you've got a limited amount of time left on this earth, mm -hmm. unless he succeeds with Neuralink. Where are you going to devote that time, right? Are you going to devote that time to fixing the housing industry? Is that a high priority for you? And, you know, it's like when people ask him about eVTOL, he says, well, the regulatory environment is complicated. I don't have the, you know, we don't have the bandwidth for that. I think he means he doesn't have the bandwidth for it. Yeah. I think he chooses his battles. I think you, I mean, you and I are probably the same in that sense. We have a lot of stuff going on and there's only so much we can handle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course he can handle a lot more than I can, but I think he, I think now, the question becomes, there's a lot of bright people at Tesla. Like, mm -hmm. I think Drew Baglino is a really, really bright guy. Mm -hmm. And I think Drew is, my gut is Drew is going to be running Tesla when Elon leaves. Mm -hmm. And he might pursue that. He might get the first principles concept. He might be able to carry on in Elon's legacy and then pursue something like Tesla housing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't think, I don't see Elon doing it. Mm -hmm. I, I think that Elon has been very clear Mars Colony and Neuralink mm -hmm. are the two big things of the future. And I think, you know, like we didn't talk about Boring Company much. I think the potential for Boring Company, like if you have all these robo taxis on the roads, you're going to create more traffic problems, mm -hmm. right? But what if you build a Boring Company network in every city? Now, I don't think that requires the same technical challenges that a lot of the other stuff he's talking about, but I think there's something there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um <laughs> This has been a fun conversation so far. Um, definitely appreciate your your openness to talk about all these different topics. Um, yeah. On a personal note, um, um, you said you're a retired or former uh, DIU or DUI I am. I am still a DUI. Lawyer. I'm still a lawyer. Lawyer, okay. I'm, I'm retiring from the New York. I'm a New York and Florida lawyer. I'm, I'm planning okay. to stop working. I, I haven't really done much work in New York in a long time. I handle occasional traffic ticket in New York still. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm stopping that. I've actually handed off my New York traffic cases to other lawyers. I just resolved the DUI case today in Florida. Um, so, but yes, I am a lawyer and I still do a tiny bit of legal work. I'm planning to move on from that. I don't, I don't like being a lawyer that much. Okay. Got it. I think I'm, I'm reasonably good at it, but I don't like it. Cool. Um, I want to ask you a few questions from, uh, some, uh, Twitter followers. Um, Mars resident says, um, why doesn't Warren use options based on his price target? If Tesla's worth 10,000 or 100,000 in 2030, in the money or out of the money options would yield him much more return. What are your thoughts? I never got into options enough mm -hmm. and I've, I've looked at them a little bit. I, I got, I had a lot of people asking about options for a long time and I fundamentally do not want to spend the time figuring them out. It's too complicated. It's like, you know, you, you decide what you're going to put your thoughts into. And I'm, I'm, I, I own a lot of Tesla stock. Mm -hmm. I own a lot of Tesla stock. And if Tesla goes up where I think it's going to go, I'm going to have, like, I already have more money than I need. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At, at, some, at a certain point, it's like, well, do I want to spend my time playing games? Because to me, to me, the options world is, is really, a, it's like a game. 
It's yeah. you're playing games. I know there's this one guy, is it Bruce Burnsworth or something, who's always talking about leaps mm -hmm. and he's buying leaps. And I looked at it and I didn't see that it was that compelling. And you're sort of here's one of the problems. Okay, you can't buy 10 year options. Mm -hmm. You can buy two year options. Yeah. Well, the share price on a given day is not the, the short term share price, and even going out a year, the short term share price is not driven by long term investors. The short term share price is driven by short term traders. Mm -hmm. And I don't have confidence that two years from now, if I buy Tesla leaps now, that two years from now, even if I think Tesla's grown a lot, I don't have confidence that the short term traders won't keep Tesla from reaching its true value. So when I, you know, it's funny you used the term price target at the beginning. I don't really talk about price targets because price target is a Wall Street term. I talk about what I think the company is going to be worth and what it should translate to in terms of share price. Unfortunately, Wall Street investors and, and short-term traders and day traders have a lot more influence over what the share price is at a given moment. Like if you ask mm -hmm. me right now, Tesla stock is worth $2,500 a share. Mm -hmm. Sure. But the traders are keeping it from, from reaching its true value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. What percent of your portfolio is in uh, Tesla stock? Um, I have different accounts. So my my main account is a retirement account, an IRA, and it's eighty five. It's eighty to eighty five percent in Tesla, depending on what the share price is on a given day. Okay. So and then I manage some f family accounts that are about fifty percent in Tesla. Okay, got it. And then, um, um, are you planning just to step out of law and just retire then, or what, or I mean, I guess you could focus more on your channel. I'm curious on your channel, like, um, what's been your experience? Like, why did you start a YouTube channel in the first place? What was kind of like the tipping well, point? Started the channel a long time ago, just for the heck of it. Then I was making videos about political stuff and videos about criminal justice. And what it was just sort of like a hobby. It wasn't something serious. I mean, I did it, but it wasn't serious. And I didn't put a lot of time and I didn't make a lot of videos. So I think it was September 2019. I made a video about Starship. And uh, that video did really well. I'm like, okay, I made another video. I, mean, I was watching your channel. I was watching Now You Know. I was watching some other channels. Like, I could probably do this. So I started making more videos and more videos, and it just kept working. Mm -hmm. Right? So, but it was September 2019. I made a video about Starship that did really, you know, got like 100,000 views or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it put me over the, thousand, the threshold. I had been monetized in the past, and they changed monetization, monetization rules, and I was demonetized. Mm -hmm. And then I... I got monetized again. I'm like, all right, let's see if, you know, I'm not doing anything else. I, I wasn't that busy doing other things. I started building it up. And, you know, if you go back and look at my early videos, I don't have the production quality. I don't have the, the sound quality. Like I've got this nice microphone now, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm using a DSLR camera and I bought a new computer with some of the money I've made to, to do everything better. I've got fancy lights here, mm -hmm. you know, on the side to, I, that's not still in the view, is it? No, um, no, it's not. Yeah, I, you know, I keep, I, I, I got, you know, the blue light behind me, right? Mm -hmm. You know, this one over there. So I've upped, upped the production quality. But basically, I just, it, it started working and I kept, I, I'm not the kind of guy who like does one thing and just goes all in. I'm always trying something different. Mm -hmm. And when something starts working, I do more of it. Mm -hmm. And the YouTube channel started working and I started doing more of it. And honestly, I enjoy it more. I don't really like being a lawyer, to be blunt. Um, I, I am a, a lawyer. There's lawyers who write, you know, write wills and stuff. There's lawyers who do stuff that's less conflict oriented. Mm -hmm. A lot of my work is conflict oriented and I'm tired of the conflict. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't mind the conflict when you and I argue about a battery valuation model. Yeah. But when I'm in when the middle of a conflict and a judge is threatening to put my client in prison. Well, that, that's a little more stressful. And I just like, okay, I've done enough of that. And, you know, like I just had a good day as a lawyer, right? I just got my client a great deal. Um, and it was because I did work that I think a lot of other lawyers wouldn't have done. And I know I delivered value. And if somebody else calls me with a similar situation, I'm going to do it. But I just don't enjoy it the same way that I enjoy engaging with the YouTube community, um, engaging with the Twitter community. I'm really excited about what Tesla's doing. I'm really excited about what SpaceX is doing, boring company Neuralink. I think there's a lot of exciting stuff in our future. I actually think that robotaxis are going to destroy the criminal defense and personal injury world that I operate in, <laughs> right? Because once yeah. the cars are driving, then they're, you know, they're going to be better than human. They're going to reduce the number of accidents. They're going to be recording everything that the fake, the fake accidents go away. Um, more than half, this is something, if you don't mind me going off on this because you asked me about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, go for it. More than half of all criminal cases or more than half of all traffic tickets and criminal cases together start with a traffic stop. Really, I think more than half of all criminal cases start with a traffic stop. Drunk driving, reckless driving, 
driving with a suspended license. These are some of the most common. People think the most common, they, they think it's all murders. I've never handled a murder. I've, I've been a criminal defense lawyer since 2003. I've never handled a murder. I've never handled anything close to a murder. I've handled a couple death cases, but no, nothing close. Um, the, the TV shows are all about this other stuff. Most of what we do is speeding tickets, drunk driving, driving with a suspended license. And there are, a lot of it's fairly routine, but every once in a while there's conflict. So robo taxis eliminate more than half of all criminal cases and they eliminate more than half of all personal injury cases. Mm -hmm. So the work that I do is gonna go, and I'll tell you, you're all gonna feel bad for the lawyers when I say this, but when I tell this to lawyers, they, they get really upset. <laughs> and I know, I know that your audience and my audience both feel very bad for the lawyers, right? We all, everyone's worried about the poor lawyers. I'm just looking ahead, like I don't really like doing it anyway. And I should, I'll pump my book while we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. This is my, this is my book, Fair DUI, mm -hmm. which is on Amazon. Just Google, just search on Amazon for Fair DUI. And don't buy the one someone's selling for $15. It's only $5 for the paperback. There's actually people who sell my book. Oh, really? Huh? For, like for extra, for $10 more than it's, and plus shipping. Like you can buy it for $5 with, you know, Amazon Prime or $3 on Kindle. But um, that's just this weird thing with Amazon. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just, I think. I just got tired of it. I'm done with it. I, I, I'm, I also think people think we make a lot more money than we do. <laughs> I mean, some lawyers make a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But, and I've made, a, I've had some good years, but overall it's like, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of conflict and YouTubing is a lot more fun. And I, and I'm starting up a venture. I'm trying thinking mm -hmm. about starting up a venture capital fund as well, Wow, which is another interesting thing. What is that? So, what is that about? Um, it's a little bit of, I've been investing. I, I was looking at investing in SpaceX, boring company in Neuralink, and it's very hard to invest in SpaceX, and it's arguably impossible to invest in boring company in Neuralink. But ultimately, you know that they do funding rounds. So I'm looking at can I start up a and I just I've got making progress. Then it feels like I'm going two steps forward and one step back all the yeah. time. But I'm making some progress towards starting a fund where I get other people to go in with me. We form a fund and we go after some of Elon's companies or maybe some other companies. I don't want to get too specific because yeah. you get into all this like SEC stuff. Yeah. But yeah. but but fundamentally, I feel like when I got into it, like a lot of you want to do venture capital investing, you buy into some fund, they charge you a 2% annual management fee, they charge you what's called 20% carried interest, which means they, they're taking 20% of the gain, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so you're taking out the high end and you're paying all these costs along the way. And you're sort of counting on the VCs, the venture capital funds, to actually know which companies to invest in. And I want to change it to where let's identify a company we all want to invest in. Hint, it's an Elon company. And let's put our money in it. Since we're only doing this one thing, maybe we can keep expenses lower. And maybe we can reduce the carried interest so that you have a lower cost of doing it. You get the company, you choose the company you want to invest in rather than having some venture capitalist choose which company you invest in. And we're able to... Um, um, and you're, you're, you're getting more, you're getting more of the gain. You're not yeah. losing yeah. to the gain to the venture capital yeah. company. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been looking into this stuff for actually a while myself. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, maybe after the interview, I could share some of my sure. ideas, but um, yeah, it's extremely, yeah, it's a complicated world of yep. trying to invest um, into Elon's companies. Um, yeah. So um, thanks uh, so much, Warren, for your time. Um, going over all this stuff and I appreciate the yeah. dialogue. Um, it's been super interesting, helpful for me and hopefully for others as well. And, um, yeah, I think overall it's, it's, um, I like to, I, I enjoy actually the, the process of, of going back and forth. And I mean, yeah. both of us ex are extremely bullish, you know, obviously on, on Tesla and, and the future. So, um, and you know, I, I'm appreciative of the larger Tesla community as well. You know, there's so many people who, who chip in and who give, you know, different, you know, additions and, and, and add to the, the complete dialogue. So um, definitely appreciate you um, and your role and your channel as well. I'll go ahead and link to your YouTube channel in the video description and also your Twitter account. Um, is there anything else that you had on your mind? No, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually for some, I think I had my volume on my headphones too loud and I'm actually tired. <laughs> I, I think I, I, yeah, I, I had turned my, I had turned my volume up for something I was doing the other day and I forgot to turn it down. And I, I'm like, why am I so tired? Why am I, I think, I think I had the, I just turned the volume down. So I think it was wearing me out. Yeah. No worries. Thank, th listen, thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed this conversation. Cool. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Warren. We'll talk to you there. All right.